Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Social Service Summit 2021. I'm Susan Ng. I want to thank you all very much for being with us today. We're also very pleased to have with us the host of the summit, Mr. Masagos Zokifli. And Mr. Masagos is the Minister for Social and Family Development and also Second Minister for Health, along with our distinguished guests who are with us today. And again, we thank you all, those of you at home as well, who are joining us today. The theme for this year's summit is an apt one. It is one that is in keeping with the times, reimagining the social service sector, something we definitely need to think about and talk about. The program has been very carefully curated for leaders from the social service ecosystem to exchange ideas, to collaborate, and to reimagine together. To kickstart the summit, I'd like to share with you a video. A video that celebrates how we overcame adversity as a sector and also how we leverage opportunities to change. And we do want you to take a few moments to enjoy the video. Thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic, families faced financial challenges. We found out that there was a couple of seniors that was mentally affected. When we called the caregivers, they do share that they have lost the job, so it was really tough. We started digital transformation in a speed that we have not expected. My name is Alvina. I was diagnosed with depression in 2015. I was retrenched in March 2020. Every day I'm trying and then face failures. It actually brought me down a lot. And Miracle Hackman, Tel's ED, contacted me on the 2nd of July and he asked me if I'm keen to join Tel as a part time staff. The service we provide is people centered care. We call a few thousand caregivers from our database. And these are the caregivers who have not connected with Cal for many years. We listen to uh, what they have to share and we give them emotional support. I'm now a program manager with Caregivers Alliance and I'll be supporting many, many more caregivers. Hi, my name is Molly. I'm the Senior Centre Manager of uh, Queenstown SCN and in charge of Gimor AAC and uh, Mailing AAC. During COVID, it affected very much on the senior. During these periods, there was a lot of uh, social isolations and uh, seniors are not allowed to come down to pay a visit to the centre. As you know, our seniors, are, most of them are actually pioneer generations. So most of them are illiterate in uh, technology. It was uh, quite difficult for us to really get them to be interested. This lady who is 82 years old, Madam Ong, she says that if going to study, touch it, what am I? But during COVID period, the session where we are teaching, she managed to learn WhatsApp, how to take photo, and also basic online payment. Upon hearing that, I was very happy that at least she has learned something useful. Hi, um, I'm Johan. I am the Executive Director of Engineering Good. When Circuit Breaker first started, we had beneficiaries who really needed the laptops. Allowing people to donate their laptops was one way we thought would be a good way of involving the community, involving people who wanted to help but didn't know how. I had a whole bunch of engineers who really wanted to uh, help. So it's kind of like a, a perfect storm. We repair computers. We know very well that we're not very good at interfacing with the end users. Therefore, we work with other people to interface with the end users. Together, we can actually make things better for our community in a much more productive way. I'm Adriana, a community worker with AMK FSC Community Services. When we had learning conversations during the COVID-19 period, it coincided with the home-based learning period during the circuit breaker restrictions. There was a mad scramble for families and children to find laptops because they didn't have any. We came across uh, Engineering Good and we realised that they can support like, in terms of provision of laptops to the families. 
So this partnership of bringing laptops to the families also presents an opportunity for families to strengthen their connections with neighbours in the community. These increasingly complex challenges requires us to have partnership with different agencies with varying expertise to be able to collectively address pressing issues or concerns in the community. I'm Pastor Andrew. I'm the founder and the CEO of New Hope Community Services. NCSS has been actively providing funding to build capabilities in the organisations and help us in many ways in strategic partnership. If we were to uh, imagine what Kampong City Club can become, people can book the facility anywhere and anytime. Eh? We want to have a better outreach and make it easier for them to engage us, to be connected with us. My name is N.K. Hung. I'm the Executive Director for uh, JP Morgan Singapore and I'm also the Co-Chair for Good Works Singapore. Uh, the scope for JP Morgan is basically employee engagement and volunteerism. We decided to partner with New Hope at a strategic level to bring in the skill-based volunteerism to help them to bridge that gap so that they can evolve from there. I saw the strength of having a partner like JP Morgan to help us. The SSA 3.0 vision gives us the aspiration to engage the professionals and that include the volunteers to write on the resources that are out there to help us enhance our service delivery to our clients to have a more meaningful, sustained engagement with the different stakeholders to become a centre of excellence. We have to try different ways to help people Issues like how to approach to get help. I really wish that we can work together to be more patient and be able to teach the senior technology of future use. As an interconnected group of individuals and organisations, we can do so much better than work in silos. Where community, including the service users themselves, can contribute and co-create solutions to these issues. And indeed, I hope that we can and we must continue to work together as we transform the way we serve and create new possibilities for the community. And I just wanted to say that on a personal note, the last year and a half, I've been able to speak with not just Anita, but so many social service agency heads and staff, your users, their family, their caregivers, that is very heartening for me, I feel, Anita, to be someone outside of the sector and yet involved in a way to see that we are able to change the way we think, work, and, and also be with our social service users. And this is the change we all talked about. It's just been fast forwarded several years and the best stories I've heard are really from the social service users themselves. So kudos to all of you for doing the fabulous work that you already do and I know you will continue to do. And so we kickstart our program proper now by introducing Anita Pham, someone who's given her heart and her soul, her time to the sector in her own way and also to serve you and us. Anita is President of the National Council of Social Service to provide this morning's welcome address. Anita. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, Minister Masago Sukifli and friends. Welcome to our annual Social Service Summit. I'm so grateful that close to 700 of us are able to gather today, albeit virtually. First and foremost, I would like to thank each and every one of you for persevering despite the challenges that the pandemic has presented us with. You have worked tirelessly to ensure that services to our service users have remained uninterrupted, which was very much needed during these trying times. I was also very deeply moved by the video earlier and am proud of all the efforts made to serve the community. 
we need to work together to ensure that our sector remains resilient, agile, and ready to meet any challenges which the future may bring. 2020 more than tested our resilience and uncovered gaps in the sector. As the COVID-19 situation is still evolving, we must continue to seize the opportunity to make ourselves ready for whatever the future holds for us. In May 2020, we convened the Beyond COVID-19 Task Force, where we brought together leaders from different sectors to develop plans so that we could emerge stronger post-pandemic. Through the findings, we identified key challenges and gaps that the sector faced. However, we should not see these as just gaps. Rather, these are opportunities for us to do better as a sector. Let me share more on each of these opportunities. First, the pandemic accelerated digitalization in our sector. We need to continue this momentum. Technology can help us enhance operational effectiveness and deliver quality social services. It is important that SSAs continue to build up their competencies and capabilities to manage data and digital projects. For example, through the NCSS Back to Basics project, APSN Centre for Adults adopted a functional rehabilitation system. This sought to simulate real-life tasks to deliver contextualised training, which increased training efficiency and empowered trainees to be viably employed in the workforce. Secondly, we need to harness the potential of volunteers as a key way to augment manpower. We need to tap on the increasing social consciousness and interest in volunteerism that arose from the COVID-19 pandemic to support organisational needs. Thus, volunteer management is an essential skill that we need to grow. We also need to work closely with our friends in the corporate sector to tap on their expertise, experience and resources. Thirdly, to increase funding sustainability, we need to explore new modes of fundraising. We also need to be cognizant of the changing behaviour of our donors and funders by adopting a philanthropic mindset. And I will share more about this mindset shift later. Fourth, as part of service delivery, we need to be innovative in the way we deliver our services. This could be through the use of digital tools. We also need to empower and leverage the strengths of our service users by co-creating, co-designing, and even co-delivering user-centric services and solutions. Fifth, regarding leadership in the sector, we need to adopt adaptive leadership to overcome the current and future challenges and crises. To achieve this, we need board members who are diverse and able to bring in knowledge from different sectors to our sector, yet be able to understand and grasp the intricacies and challenges which are peculiar to our sector. Also, our SSAs need to work towards making sure that both their board and management leadership are in strategic alignment. That is the key for sustained organisational success. With the opportunities that I've mentioned, the social service sector must strive to continually transform and respond to the needs exacerbated by COVID-19. The theme for this year's summit is reimagining the social service sector, most apt as we move into the next normal together. To this end, I wish to share two thoughts which I feel are fundamental to us changing the way we do things in this sector. First, we should be person-centred and system-centric not program-centric. Secondly, we should shift from a fundraising mindset to a philanthropic mindset. 
By being person-centered, we should put the service user at the very core of what we do and prioritize the service user's quality of life. Traditionally, with program funding, we support a service user through just one program or with just one SSA. Adopting a person-centered, system-centric approach requires a fundamental shift in how some of our services are to be delivered, as well as how we are to define our roles and relationships going forward, not only as social sector professionals, but also of our service users too. Therefore, as we progressively adopt an integrated, person-centered approach, we should work less in silos and instead think more about working across services, agencies, and sectors such as social, health, and education. We also need to encourage and increase collaboration with private, sec private sector organizations to leverage their strengths and ours. We saw this earlier in the video where AMK FSC and New Hope collaborated with the private sector to enhance their internal capabilities. The second mindset shift is moving from the concept of fundraising to philanthropy. Fundraising is resource generation focused on the now, with limited potential for the future. We therefore need to inject the science of philanthropy into fundraising to take it to new heights. Philanthropy is a more strategic long-term approach to resourcing, which will help our SSAs achieve sustained income outcomes and create empowered, independent communities. Traditional program funding rarely covers the full cost of running a program and typical overhead rates do not capture true administrative costs. I hope that SSAs, donors and funders will appreciate the full costs involved in delivering quality social services and fund for the long haul, which includes general operating costs, as well as capacity building. Corporate functions too are a critical part of SSA capability for us to emerge stronger in the next normal and bet provide better quality services to those in need. In short, we need to change our mindset and fund for growth. We also need to build up trust capital between a funder and the recipients through open and strategic conversations on resourcing. Such relationships may go beyond financial support and involve other activities such as mentoring or board membership. This will allow the funders to gain a more in-depth understanding of the SSA's activities and spending. With the trust cultivated, funders will be able to support an SSA's mission and objectives by providing funding to cover core costs rather than time-limited projects. From the funding recipient perspective, the comfort of a financial buffer enables an SSA to think longer term optimize resources, and invest in corporate capabilities needed to achieve financial sustainability. Increasingly, donors are seeing the value of long-term sustained impact. Data is an asset for philanthropy because it helps funders get the most social capital out of every dollar that they have invested. It is therefore essential to, for the sector to equip itself with a necessary understanding so that they can articulate and measure social impact. In addition, we also need to explore different resourcing possibilities, such as starting a social enterprise which can provide a separate income generation source, exploring creative funding instruments, or the creation of an endowment fund which can provide a sustainable, recurrent annual source of income. Not one size fits all. So what I've suggested here will work for some of our SSAs and not all. The key here is to explore. 
At today's summit, we would also like to take the opportunity to explore and discuss what the next iteration of our service sector strategic thrust, also known as the 4ST, should be. We first shared the 4ST in 2017 after much consultation with many of you as part of our social service ecosystem. The 4ST is our sector roadmap, which details the shared aspirations for our sector and the pathways to fulfil them. A lot of significant work has been done over the past five years under each thrust, and, and let me share some examples. Our first thrust is empowered individuals, their families and communities. At the service user level, various initiatives have been launched by SSAs to empower our service users. For example, Voices for Hope by Alzheimer's Disease Association empowers people living with dementia and their caregivers to step up and speak up as self-advocates to promote greater acceptance of individuals who are coping with dementia. At a sector level, through the NCSS quality of life studies, needs were aggregated and communicated to bring about systemic change for our vulnerable groups. To ensure that people are connected and able to access resources and knowledge, the Social Service Navigator was launched in 2018 as a one-stop online portal providing information on social services. This was the first time that such comprehensive information on such services had been consolidated on an online platform. NCSS will continue to update and enhance the social service navigator to best support sector needs. We also increase the participation of vulnerable populations in the workplace and community. For example, through Mandaki's Back to Work Women's Programme, women who were unemployed for a long period of time were equipped with job-ready skills to return to the workforce and be self-sufficient. I am also happy to announce the launch of the Empowerment Guide. This guide is our response to your feedback on what empowerment means in practice and application. It aims to translate the practice of empowerment in the social service sector by breaking down the concept into relatable and practical terms. I highly encourage all social service leaders and practitioners to use the practical steps listed in the guide to start your own empowerment journey. By doing so, you will find that service delivery will improve. The guide is relevant to anyone who is keen on applying the concept of empowerment to what you do in your various capacities, whether you are funder, researcher, or advocate. The journey to empowerment is a collective dynamic effort, ever-changing. So we need to walk this journey together. As part of Thrust 2, which is effective social purpose entities that deliver quality, innovative and sustainable solutions, we have augmented the manpower capabilities of the sector and increased the capacity and capability of our social purpose entities. In the past year, NCSS supported 28 SSAs in their organization development journey. We also supported SSAs in improving their human resources practices through our people practice consultancy and provided manpower funding for SSAs to hire new talent for capability building projects, focusing on organization transformation under our transformation support scheme. To better support our volunteer management practitioners who play a critical role in recruiting, training and engaging volunteers, NCSS will be launching a learning and development roadmap for them. This roadmap will provide guidance on the skills and competencies required for our volunteer management practitioners to perform effectively. We can also all look forward 
to the launch of the Community Capability Trust Fund, which kicks in next year. The CCT will drive capability and capacity building within our sector over the next decade. We have also made significant progress under Thrust 3, which is a caring, collaborative and impactful social service ecosystem. We did so by increasing giving to the social service sector through the Comcare Fund, Care and Share Funding, and more recently, the Courage Fund and Invictus Fund in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is also encouraging to see more of our sector stakeholders and partners adopting a more philanthropic mindset in terms of corporate giving. One such example is the Maybank Momentum Grant. Launched by Maybank Singapore and the Majority Trust earlier this year, this interest-free recyclable grant will provide capital and capacity support to up to 20 small charities who have been struggling due to the pandemic. It is the first of such grants in Singapore, and I understand it's still open for you to apply. I do hope that we'll see more of such collaborative efforts in the years to come. With the opportunities in the sector, which I had shared earlier, as well as the larger shifts in the societal dynamics, it is opportune for us to refresh the forest tea and relook areas of priorities in the sector for the next five years and beyond. As we embark on the next iteration of the 4ST from 2022 onwards, service users will be kept at the core of what we do as we stay true to the 4ST vision of every person empowered to live with dignity in a caring and inclusive society. The next iteration of the 4ST will include actionable steps to guide the sector in achieving the strategic directions and outcomes laid out in the roadmap. I am excited to hear your views and suggestions at the breakout sessions today on how we can do this together. Although we are meeting virtually today, I can see that our virtual room is filled with current and future leaders, all with the potential to reimagine our sector's future together. My hope is that our conversations today do not end this afternoon, but will carry through long after the end of this year's summit. May you all have a very fruitful session today, and may we take this opportunity to build and tap on our collective wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita, for your welcome address. Also very inspirational words as well. Well, Anita has shared on the need to accelerate digitalizing. And also, in order for us to do that, we will need to transform. We talked about transformation. We talked about mindset change. And we talked about going back to the basics. And I do like what Anita did say about going back to the basics. That becomes important. Increasing funding sustainability is important. Innovating service delivery, I think, a mindset change is needed for us to look ahead to see how services are delivered and how services continue to be received in what Anita has termed, and I love this term, the next normal. We talk about the new normal, the new normal is actually here, but it's the next normal that we're talking about. And also to adopt adaptive leadership in the social service sector. And, you know, we want to move forward to a more person-centered and philanthropic mindset for greater impact. And Minister, I was about to invite you on stage, but I see that you're with us already up here. Uh, this is where we're going to actually launch uh, a special program. And we're going to invite Minister to speak with us first. Minister Masagos, for all of you who are viewing us, uh, Minister for Social and Family Development, sir. Ms. Anita Pham, President of NCSS, friends and partners from the community, corporate and public sectors, good morning. 
I'm happy to join you for this year's Social Service Summit. It's befitting that I begin by recognizing and expressing my gratitude to all our social service professionals and partners present for your tremendous contributions to our nation in the past year and more. During the peak of the crisis, you stood valiantly at the front lines in our community supporting Singaporeans in need, adapted and transformed the way you work to meet new challenges, forge new partnerships across people, private and public sectors. I know it hadn't always been easy, especially when they were added demands driven by the pandemic. But because of your tenacity, many needs were met, lives supported, spirits lifted during one of the darkest crises in modern times. Not only for Singapore, but the entire world. Today, we are in a stronger position than we were one year ago, and we will continue to overcome together. Generations of Singaporeans have been confronted by their fair share of crises and challenges. Our struggle for independence, fractures, racial riots, and global recessions that threaten to cripple our economy. Each time, through tenacity and good fortune, we emerged stronger, grew more resilient, and deepened our resolve to make Singapore succeed. Our social compact, uniquely of Singapore, built upon the strong work ethic and strict social discipline of our pioneers, enable us to overcome and not buckle from wave after wave of crises that we faced. Our social compact is one where the government strives to create the best conditions for Singaporeans to flourish through good growth, not only for our economy, but also in building resilient institutions, infrastructure, and social structures. Providing Singaporeans with the opportunities to do well at every stage of their lives, where families form the foundation of society and our first line of support. Strong families, in turn, support the nurturing of resilient individuals who seek to work hard for themselves and their family and to give back to society. The community plays an active role in uplifting those in need, creating a cycle of virtue and national spiritedness. All of us are part of this social compact. We play an important role, social service professionals, corporates, community partners, volunteers, and public servants. We enable, we care, and we unite. For those who have fallen upon difficult times, we enable them to bounce back on their two feet. Even for those with disabilities, we find ways to enable them. We know, though, some may require permanent support and it's our responsibility to care for their needs, raising their quality of life, and enabling them to live with dignity. Finally, we unite our people by making them be a part of this mission, encouraging those who have done well to give back. As a way to pay for flourishing and an enabling environment, so that even more can be enabled and cared. To do all this well, we need a professional and well-functioning social service ecosystem. All the more so because social needs will continue to rise. Our population is aging, one of the fastest in the world, and this will constrain our future labour force. We will also be put in a tough fiscal position as healthcare spending rises and as our society matures and stratifies in some respects, 
social mobility will become harder, just like what has happened in other advanced economies. While we are dealing with the current challenges of the immediate crisis, we need to continue keep our focus on the long-term challenge. Because if we fail today, it's not our generation that will suffer, but future generations. The promise of an uplifting society will become history and a remnant of the past. How then do we move forward? How do we ensure that we as a social service sector continue to stay impactful and equipped to address these challenges? Last year, in the midst of the crisis, I challenged the sector and every SSA to make the leap towards SSA 3.0, to challenge ourselves, to transform the way we work, to make a quantum leap so that we can deliver services more effectively for the longer term. Today, I would like to speak on three areas of how SSA 3.0 looks like. First of all, it starts with us building leadership at all levels, from the board to senior management, down to every staff and volunteer. We should strive to build cones of leadership throughout our organizations cultivating an environment where executives are empowered and able to innovate rather than being constrained or interfered with. This requires leadership and trust from the top to provide the strategic direction and be willing to delegate downwards where needed, freeing up bandwidth to focus on guiding their organizations to push the frontiers of innovation, achieve skill, and in turn, drive larger impact. For instance, by forging new alliances with other like-minded organizations, encouraging the cross-pollination of best practices across sectors, and investing in technology. Another example would be in scenario planning to ensure that your organizations are future-proofed, especially amid changing demographics and the shrinking talent pool. How can we, for example, steer organizations to achieve a larger impact even with less? Second, ensuring good governance. As our organizations grow in scale and expand our reach, how do we put in place systems and structures that encourage transparency and accountability. Many of our services are funded by public monies and the generosity of donors. Transparency must therefore be a core part of our culture, a basic hygiene factor, so that we are accountable and are prudent stewards of the resources that have been entrusted to us. Public trust, once lost, will be hard to earn back. Whenever a major breach occurs, the ramifications go beyond the individual organization, chipping at the reputation and professional standing of this sector. Governance is also about creating a structure where each level of leadership executes within its boundaries of authority, knowing not to interfere or intervene beyond. I first learned this long back when I read the preamble to the form, in the form of a short biography of Sun Tzu to the epic Art of War written more than 2,500 years ago. Apparently, after hearing about the Art of War, the King of Wu challenged Sun Tzu to put his theories to the test, issuing him a proper royal edict to train his army of 180 concubines. Now, it may be a royal edict, but I think it was also a way to amuse himself. Sun Tzu agreed and trained them with drum drills over and over. But of course, he was met with laughter and ridicule. Now, in battle, officers who fail to carry out commands risk a battle being lost. 
and in those days are punished severely. So, Sun Tzu thus ordered the execution of two of the king's favourite concubines, whom he had put in charge of this so-called army in training. The king, of course, protested because he knew his jest was being carried too far. But Sun Tzu replied, Having once received His Majesty's commission to be the general of his forces, there are certain commands of His Majesty which I am unable to accept. He proceeded to execute them, and the army of concubines immediately moved in military precision. Now, many of you would have been understandably aghast at this ancient brutality and would probably remember this tale for that part most. But when I first read this long ago, what stuck in my mind to this day was how the king, having issued an edict for Sun Tzu to command the concubines, he could not and would not overstep and undermine Sun Tzu's authority. Nobody was above the law including the king. This is governance in the extreme. But the idea of being clear of the roles we play and not overstepping them and disempowering others down the line from exercising their responsibility is a, learn, is a lesson still worth keeping in mind today. And indeed, the king keeping to a covenant was also what probably kept Sun Tzu loyal to him, who went on to win countless battles and wars for the king. Finally, strengthening communications of our mission of enabling, of caring, and of uniting. This includes engaging a wide network of stakeholders ranging from staff, service users, and volunteers to the general public and donors. How can we look at ways to better manage and engage our clients so that our services continue to be relevant to meet their needs? Likewise, keeping volunteers meaningfully engaged, for example, by deploying them appropriately. Similar to how Sun Tzu would have used drums and flags in the day and flares in the night, we have social media as a communications force for good. How can you write on its rich and omnipresence to connect with your clients and volunteers, as well as to publicize your causes and impact to the wider public even as proof of organization transparency? How can you convert awareness to attract more volunteers and donors additional resources that can steer your organization forward in a sustainable manner. To help us get to SS 3.0, we need to ride the wave of digitalization that COVID-19 has thrusted upon the world, a key tool that can enable transformation, transformation and engender social innovation. In the medical sector, telemedicine has disrupted the traditional care paradigm. While it has been around for some number of years, it took a pandemic to tear down existing barriers and assumptions, both by practitioners and users, about how effective care can be delivered, propelling its growth. The result, greater efficiencies and convenience in the provision of healthcare without compromising the quality of care. Similarly, we can embrace and harness technology to enable us to provide services more effectively in the social services sector. We too are a high-touch sector. But just like doctors and their patients, the use of technology need not cause us to lose the personal connection in our interactions with our service users. Instead, proper use of technology can help us improve the way we work and maximize the impact for service users. 
For example, the use of speech-to-text technology to record key notes frees up time for practitioners to focus more on their clients. Being more high-tech can, in fact, free up valuable time for us to be even more high-touch. Therefore, I am pleased to launch the inaugural Industry Digital Plan for Social Services today, or what we call IDPSS. This provides a structured framework to guide SSAs in your digitalization journey. For example, you can use it to assess your organization's, organi organization's digital readiness, identify priority areas, and find solutions and funding to accelerate your digitalization plan. Another useful feature is that it provides resources for SSAs to connect with partners outside the sector who can lend their expertise and resources. One such example is the partnership between New Hope Community Services and a team of volunteers from JP Morgan and Telstra to develop an integrated application platform for their service users. It allows them to manage their schedules, facilities and equipment, empowering them to be more independent and resilient. I strongly encourage every SSA to go through the IDPSS and apply it to your organization. I thank the advisory panel led by NCSS board member Ms. Janet Young, as well as various industry and technology experts for making it come to fruition. Finally, MSF and NCSS will partner you in your journey to build up capabilities and leadership at every level in your organizations, including those that I spoke about earlier. We will do this through the new Community Capability Trust, or CCT. It's a significant source of funds dedicated to support longer-term efforts to build up SSA's capabilities through enhancing productivity and strengthening people practices. The government will provide up to $250 million in initial capital and dollar-for-dollar -dollar matching for donations to CCT over 10 years, supplemented by another $100 million by the tote board in the first five years. SSAs can also look forward to tapping the various schemes under the CCT when applications open next April. We'll also create avenues for like-minded corporates and individuals to contribute their expertise to develop our SSAs' capabilities and actively galvanize the community to donate generously towards this important cause. We will share more details about CCT later this year and look forward to your active participation. Allow me to conclude. Through the pandemic, we have seen two facets of life. On one side, the pain and suffering that COVID-19 has brought about, especially to those whose lives have were turned upside down by it. On the other, the best of the human spirit, just as we did, where we banded together lowered our barriers, worked together across organizations and sectors, all with a common goal to protect one another and the most vulnerable among us. When the pandemic is finally over, and it will be, my hope is that we will emerge stronger as one social service sector driven by resilient SSAs and empowered social service professionals in the spirit of SSA 3.0. This will enable us to serve Singaporeans better for the longer term, sustaining our social compact and creating an uplifting society for all Singaporeans. And always, we enable, we care, and we unite. I wish everyone a fruitful submit. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. May I invite you, Minister, to remain on stage, please, as I also invite Ms. Janet Young, Chairperson of IDPSS, Ms. Anita Pham, uh, who is uh, President of uh, the National Council of Social Service, and Ms. Tan Lee San, NCSS CEO, to join Minister on stage, please. The Industry Digital Plan for Social Services, or IDPSS in short, was developed by NCSS in consultation with the Ministry of Social and Family Development, the IDPSS Advisory Panel, and many other private, public, and social service sector professionals. It is a digital transformation roadmap that seeks to advance the sector's digital capabilities progressively, and SSAs can assess and accelerate accelerate their digitalization depending on their needs and also to leverage technology to provide services to the service users. And we'd now like to invite Minister, please, to launch the Industry Digital Plan for Social Services. Initiate IDPSS Sequence. Initiating Industry Digital Plan for Social Services. Five, four, three, two, one. Initialize. We have officially launched the Industry Digital Plan for Social Services, and we want to thank Minister Masagos, uh, Ms. Anita Pham, Ms. Janet Young, Ms. Tan Lee San, and all the industry partners who made this possible. We're going to now meet someone who will be providing our first keynote for today, Mr. Aaron Dignan. Now, he's going to be sharing about something that our speakers thus far have been talking about. A brave new work, how to reinvent your organization. Certainly something very important indeed. Aaron is the founder of The Ready a global organization, uh, organizational transformation and coaching practice, and also Murmur. This is a platform that helps teams create, test, share, and uphold ways of working that define their culture and their processes. And we're also very pleased to introduce our discussants for this particular session. And they're joining the segment to share their reflections after Aaron's keynote. We have Haslina Abdul Halim. Uh, Haslina is president of PPIS, also known as the Singapore Muslim Women's Association, and Dr. Vincent Ng, who is CEO of Ng Mokyo Family Service Center Community Services. Also, we're joined by Martin Tan. Martin is CEO of the Majority Trust, of course, board member of NCSS as well, and he will be moderating the Q&A session with Aaron, Haslina, and Vincent. Now, we also want to remind you that you can send in your questions and your comments for this particular segment, and please do post everything via Pigeonhole, the Pigeonhole Q&A. Martin, all yours. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Susan. It's really good to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Minister, and thank you, Anita. Uh, we're entering our first keynote, and it is so great um, to be able to be with everyone, uh, with Haas, with Vincent, and with Aaron. And Aaron is zooming in directly live from uh, Denver, Colorado. So we're looking forward to your session, Aaron, uh, on the idea of a brave new work. Over to you, my friend. Thank you so much. I am uh, pretty excited today to share a vision of Brave New Work with you all. The Social Service Summit is a pretty amazing community, so I, I am pleased to do this. But before I jump into that, I do want to ask you a question. And the question is, is work working? 
And what's interesting, I've spent the last about 10 years traveling the world, meeting teams in all different you know, countries, continents, industries, and asking them the question, what's stopping you from doing the best work of your life? And the answers I've heard have really shocked me. The answers I've heard are some of the things on this page, right? Things like approval processes and too many meetings and too much email and systems that don't talk to each other and unnecessary roles and unnecessary layers and planning processes and Gantt charts and so many things that are the trappings of modern bureaucracy that hold us back, that limit our ability to do what we need to do. And a lot of these things uh, originated a long time ago. They originated in a time and place that's far from the present moment. Now, most people refer to these things by their name, right? That's the budgeting process. That's the way we allocate resources. That's the way we staff a project. But I refer to any of these things that's holding us back. If, it, if it's something we've done for a while, but is no longer serving us as organizational debt, so you're all pretty familiar with financial debt. You borrow money, you have to pay interest on that money when you pay it back, that hurts. Uh, or technical debt, if you work in and around software or technology, you produce something early on and you kind of get it out the door, you rush to ship it. And then later on, you have to edit it and refactor it and update it to make sure that it matches the moment in the future. And that also is, is quite challenging. But organizational debt is the same thing writ large. It's all the norms and practices and procedures and roles and structures that we have inside our organizations that's no longer serving us, that we haven't yet updated, that we haven't yet refactored or reconsidered. And the price we pay for that, the interest that we pay on that debt is in our frustration, is in our inability to move quickly and change markets, our inability to attract and retain the talent that we want to attract and retain, all these different taxes that we pay on that organizational debt. And I want to share one of my favorite examples of organizational debt with you. So here we have a, a bank teller who has made a mistake on a form. There's a, a bank review, bank loan review form that they use, and they've made a mistake. And the manager who looks at that mistake realizes that their job, of course, is to provide certainty and reliability and security and predictability. And so we can't, we can't have mistakes, right? That's not allowed in this, in this world. So what they do is they design a new process by which they will solve for these mistakes. And it's what they call a four eyes process, which means when the bank teller does the form, there's also going to be a manager who's going to look it over for them. And that manager has to inspect each form to make sure that it's perfect. Now, of course, the problem with this idea is that there's not just one teller and there's not just one form and there's not just one manager. There are actually tens of forms per day across multiple managers and multiple tellers. And what it adds up to is an enormous amount of time. Each one takes you know, three, four, five minutes to analyze. And as you add them up over the course of a year, it's actually over a million dollars of human cost just to save the $10,000 from that one random error that occurred. And that's a great example of organizational debt. It seems like the right thing to do to create this procedure, to have this compliance. But in actuality, when you look at the overall impact of it, the externalities of it, it doesn't quite add up. And the same thing is true of meetings that I've audited, of processes that I've audited, different ways of working where when you actually look at, is this adding value? Is this actually driving our purpose, our outcomes, et cetera? The answer is often no. And so now we're living in this mismatch, the mismatch between the world of work that most of our practices come from and the world of work that we are in today. And I'm sure you all felt this over the past year with the pandemic. The way we work, the boxes and lines org charts, the processes and procedures, the whole mental model of modern work that is taught in business school comes from a factory floor about 110 years ago when they were trying to ensure consistency and reliability of the widgets and the foods and the shoes that they were producing in these factories at the turn of the century, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And almost all of our practices, including the way we budget, including the way we staff projects, including the way we manage them, really came from that time and that context. And yet here we are in a moment where we are doing the most creative, you know, unusual, complex, problem-solving work of our lives, dealing with how we change the future for our people, our countries, the climate, the, you know, for-profit, non-profit. It's all incredibly rich. 
And yet we're still using that kind of factory approach. And so no wonder we're frustrated. No wonder that we're upset with the way work feels and operates day to day, moment to moment. Now, there's a cost to all this, and we actually have a few uh, friends in the industry who have done the hard work of modeling what is the cost of, of all the compliance activity that even the people involved agree is not really necessary, and all the layers of management that when you actually look at competitive firms that have fewer layers is not really needed. It's just essentially excess management, excess layers in the pyramid. And what they came up with uh, at the University in London where they did this work was $3.4 trillion per year just for the United States alone and over $9 trillion globally. So we're literally wasting $9 trillion a year globally on these activities and these pyramids of power that aren't really at the end of the day adding value when you compare them to firms that think and operate differently, that are more agile, that are more lean, that are flatter, that are more decentralized, that are operating with a completely different playbook. And so it is time for a change. And I think we've heard a lot about that already today. There's been a lot of talk about what sorts of transformation and what sorts of ideas are gonna bring us into that next normal. And that's exactly what we need to now identify is what is that operating system. So if you think about the operating system in your phone or the DNA in your body, an operating system is simply the foundational beliefs and assumptions and principles and practices that make up the bedrock of how something will work. They are the things that define what's possible. So if we create an environment where one thing is true, where we design the room a certain way, we set up the furniture a certain way, we build our budgeting process a certain way, it's going to then have a knock on effect in terms of what's possible for innovation, for strategy, for reimagining the future. All those things are going to be beholden to the decisions we made initially in creating those foundations. And when I think about operating systems, my favorite example to share with audiences are the two different operating systems of the intersection. So an intersection, two roads crossing, the goal of course is to get as many cars through as possible per hour without causing accidents. And so that's the problem space. Now the two different operating systems represent two different assumptions and beliefs about people and the problem. So the one on the left is the traffic light that we're all familiar with, traffic stop, traffic light, red light, green light, yellow light, right? That's what that system is. And then the one on the right here is the roundabout. It's the system with no lights. You have to drive in and you know, give the right of way to people in the roundabout, move yourself around. And so the first question we can ask is, well, what do these two different operating systems assume about people and the problem? And it's very, very interesting when I ask audiences about this in, in live conversations, they immediately know what these systems are assuming. The system on the left is assuming that people need to be told what to do that will tell you when to stop, will tell you when to go, and we will control what happens. And in order to do that, we need to build a lot of apparatus of lights and electricity and buildings and algorithms and staff and so many things to make all that work. And then the system on the right, the assumption is they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out because that system runs on social coordination, right? It's like a flock of birds or a school of fish. It runs on people seeing each other and making sure that they respect each other in the interaction. And so it's a very, very different system. Now, what's interesting about the difference between these two is that the system on the left runs on something that I call governing constraints. And a governing constraint is like a bright red line rule. It's a rule that cannot be interpreted. So if it says stop, you must stop. If it says go, you must go. There's no room for thinking or being a creative, intelligent, adult human being. The system on the right has one governing constraint, which is that you can't go in the opposite direction of the other cars or you'll hurt people, but they have what's called an enabling constraint as well. And an enabling constraint is more like a simple rule or a heuristic or a guideline that leaves room within a framework for people to think and be creative. And that one here is to give the right of way to people in the circle. So if they're already in the circle, you have to give them room, but how much room? How tightly can we pack the circle? How many times can I drive around before I have to leave? All these things are open-ended, right? And so it creates different sets of possibilities. Now, the system on the left ultimately represents this idea of control and compliance. And the system on the right represents a, a kind of a pure version of trust and autonomy. And the reality is that at work, we have both of those polarities and we have everything in between. So every possibility, when we think about what should our vacation policy be? 
Well, we could have a very controlling, very compliance oriented, very paperworky system. We could have a very free system, like just do whatever you want and call us when it's over. Or we could have something in between, right? We get to design the solution somewhere on this spectrum. And the same is true for how we build teams, how we allocate money and resources, how we give each other feedback, how we decide who gets hired and who gets fired. All those systems, all those processes, all those policies get to be somewhere on this spectrum. And the problem isn't that one is absolutely right and the other is absolutely wrong. That's not what I'm here to say at all. There's plenty of places and situations where you need a stoplight. The problem is that we don't choose for ourselves and rethink every once in a while, why are we doing things the way that we're doing them? And so you might be wondering, well, which one works better? Well, which one does work better? Let's think about it. So which one is safer? Well, the roundabout is safer. It's about 90% safer when it comes to fatality collisions. And which one is a higher throughput, gets more cars through it per hour? Again, it's the roundabout, right? About 89% reduction in delays. And which one is cheaper to build and maintain? Again, it's the roundabout, five to 10,000 US dollars cheaper per year. And then my favorite question, which is a bit of a joke, is which one works better when the power goes out? And that's an obvious answer. Of course, the, the roundabout works better without power because it doesn't need any power. It's a very resilient system. And which one do we have 1,100 times more of in the United States? The light, a thousand times more. Now, are there a thousand times more situations where it makes sense to have a light? No, we just feel comfortable with lights because we like the idea of telling other people what to do. We like the idea of being kept safe by those above. And that is the reality that we're faced with. But now we have a chance to rethink that and to question what kind of a system do we want in each of these areas of our business? Where do we need that extra level of control? Where do we actually need the benefits that come from letting go a little bit and having that empowerment that was talked about before? Because again, the system on the right is way more empowered, but it's not more dangerous. It's actually safer. And there are so many situations at work where that is the case as well. And I've actually seen that firsthand at my own companies where I have actually changed the way we work and let go of trying to control everything and replaced it with agreements among and between people and ended up with a system that's way more profitable and way more reliable and way more fast growing in ways that I did not expect. Now, the operating system at work, of course, is not a light. It is not a roundabout. It is a set of other important areas. And these 12 areas are what we tend to focus on. Purpose, strategy, authority, innovation, information flows, membership, mastery, how we you know, grow in our, in our skill and our craft, and even things like compensation. These are the places where we have to now decide how we work and decide what our principles are. What do we believe about how these things should be done? And then what do we actually do? And if there's consistency between the belief of how things should be, the assumptions that we talked about in the light and the, and the roundabout, what are our assumptions? And then what do we actually design? What kind of solution do we create to bring about the kind of team and the kind of organization and the kind of culture that is capable of delivering on the purpose of, of our organization uh, as we go? Now, this operating system is being challenged and flipped over on its head by many organizations around the world. And I studied over 70 of them for the Brave New Work book that's hiding back there. Um, and what I learned was that most of them are doing things very differently in each of those 12 spaces. And I brought two examples today from the social service sector in the Netherlands, just as a quick example of the kind of thinking that's going on out there. So the first example is Beurtzorg, which is a home healthcare nursing organization that has over 11,000 nurses in the field. It's one of the fastest growing companies of its kind all around the world. And everywhere they open up, they completely dominate the market in providing this care for their patients. What's interesting about the system is from the moment it was founded, the founders said, we're not going to create a big bureaucracy, some big pyramid of, you know, lines and boxes and who reports to who and corporate office and all this. Instead, we're going to let groups of roughly 12 nurses in each community own that community and decide how to give service, who does what when, what are the rules, what are the norms, what are the prices, how do they go to market? And we're going to provide the bare minimum of infrastructure and support for them at a head office. And so today with 11,000 employees in the field, they have only 50 people in the head office. And over half of those people are simply coaches that go out and work with the teams to help them optimize and achieve even greater success. 
it's an unbelievable story of efficiency, but also trust and also new ways of thinking about who can make what sorts of decisions and how to divide a very large group into small manageable numbers where the teams themselves can kind of figure everything out as if they were in that roundabout. Now, another example I love is uh, Consument and Bond, which is essentially a, a policy-making organization that is consumer advocacy, right? Ke keeping, keeping consumers safe. Uh, over 200 employees with 400,000 members in the Netherlands. And they have done the same thing. They've basically given up their old traditional structures of how they've done the work and asked the team to reinvent their way of working one thing at a time. They started with meetings and then they moved into how they define their roles and then they moved into how they define how they make decisions and then they started to get into how they got paid and they continued to eat the elephant, all the different challenges that presented themselves one piece at a time until they looked back and they were like, oh my gosh, we're a completely different system now. And we're capable of so much more with the number of people that we have than we were when we began. Now, these two companies and all the others like them that I've studied share two mindsets that are incredibly powerful. The first is that they're people positive, and the second is that they're complexity conscious. Now, the people positive mindset means that you believe that people are worthy of trust and respect and that they're motivated by things like autonomy and mastery and purpose and a vision of what we can do together. They're not people that need to be you know, incentivized and cajoled and tracked and studied and forced to get up in the morning to do interesting creative work. They're people that with a good enough vision and a good enough idea of how they can add value will just show up and get it done. And the complexity conscious piece is a lot about recognizing that the world is not predictable. The world is not a wristwatch, right? There are many things that are, we can fix a car, we can fix a watch, but when it comes to things like gardens and traffic and six-year-old children, and yes, organizations and markets, these are complex systems. <clears throat> and the complex systems require a completely different approach, an approach that knows that the only way to manage those systems is to test and learn, is to poke them and see what happens, is to try things and iterate based on the learning you get from the experiment of being in contact with reality. And so these two systems are guiding the work that's happening across all the examples that we've seen. Now, usually when I get to this point in the talk, people will lean over and they'll say, hey, look, I'm very excited about all this. I want to work differently. I want to empower my employees. I want to self-organize and self-manage and be highly efficient and be a roundabout. But change doesn't work. And if I try to bring this stuff back to my organization, it's going to fail. And I agree. 90% uh, of change management fails to deliver the value it sets out to deliver. And if you ask people on the front lines who work a cash register or wait a table or code software or do a sales call, only 6% of all change initiatives actually deliver value where the edge can feel it, where the people that work all the way out there can actually feel what's going on. And the reason for that is that we think change looks like this. It's a, it's a valley of despair. It's a, it's a grief process that we have to go through that we don't wanna go through because change is happening to us instead of through us. And that is hugely problematic, right? Of course, if you do something to someone that they don't wanna happen or they don't understand, they're gonna drag their feet, they're gonna resist. But what about change that happens through us, change that we define for ourselves? That's more interesting. And by the way, if you have a lot of money and, and you can afford it, some of our you know, blue chip clients out there in the world, then the change process often looks like this which is the exact same thing, except you get 3D and eagles and bridges. But it's the same broken idea that we all have to go through this terrible thing to get to the other side. And what we want to advocate for at the ready and with Brave New Work is no, no, no. Actually, when you study change that works, people will tell you, it, we just have to do change differently. People resist change done badly. They don't resist change at all. And so let's change how we change means that if you want to get somewhere, different than where you are today. You have to start the way you mean to finish. If you start with Gantt charts and controls and top down and these date targets, and by this date, we're gonna do this thing, you're not gonna to get to an agile, trusting, empowering, responsive place. If you want those things, you have to actually start that way. And that means starting with a process that looks a lot more like this. And we refer to this as continuous participatory change. Continuous because we're doing it all the time. We're learning and living and changing all the time in small ways, right? In ways that just teach us in the moment. Participatory because it's not just up to me. It's not up to the CEO. It's not up to the CFO. It's not up to the manager of this group over there. It's actually up to each team at every level to engage with the question. And the question is, 
What's stopping you from doing the best work of your life? As I said, what's stopping you from doing the best work of your life? Everyone has an answer for that. It only takes 30 seconds for the average person I ask in an elevator to tell me what's stopping them from doing the best work of their life. And then have that discussion with the team and figure out, well, all right, now we know what our tension is. What are all the possible things that we could try that would unlock that? You don't like the way we budget. You don't like the way we meet. You have too much email. What could we try? What's possible? What's out there? And some of the examples I just showed you and the other 68 that are hiding behind them, you know, they're doing things differently. There's a great opportunity to find new ways of working and bring them into your organization all around the world, in every country I visited, in every community, in every industry. And then most important of all, let's do an experiment, right? What is a safe to try, safe to fail way to bring that practice to life and see if it helps, see if it changes things for the better. And so I often say, do a radical thing at a non-radical scale. And what I mean by that is do something that's really groundbreaking, but at a scale that's small enough and safe enough and short enough that if it doesn't work, nobody loses their job. But if it does work, ooh, it's so interesting because now what if we scaled this? What if we blew this out? What if we did more of this? What would that mean for the organization? And so that's the learning loop that we're in. We're going from tension to practice to experiment, tension to practice to experiment in every team, at every level, all the time, maybe one at a time. You know, it doesn't have to be a hugely overwhelming thing. It can be 15 minutes a week of our attention. But what we're doing is we're building a learning organization. We're building a system that is slowly getting better all the time. And as a result, we're actually able to move into the future and adapt to what's coming. And when something like the pandemic hit, all the organizations that I studied were incredibly graceful at adapting and moving and flowing with it because they built an operating system designed to do just that. It's as if the power went out on the stoplight for everyone else, but they were already in a roundabout and they just didn't care. And so the big idea here is to learn to do things differently. And I'll leave you with this very short anecdote. In the early 1960s, the high jump was done like this. And the high jump was basically done front ways, head first, and you had to land on your feet. And if you landed on your feet, you'd be safe. But if you fell or you landed on your, on your, on your body, you'd be injured. And so nobody did it any other way. But then later in the 60s, new foams and synthetics and materials came out and the rules changed. And suddenly there was a mat on the other side, a pad waiting for you on the other side of the bar. And suddenly a young high schooler named Dick Fosbury started to jump over headfirst and backwards. And his coaches said, Dick, don't do that. That's not how it's done. And then he went to the University of Oregon and continued to do it there. And his coaches there said, Dick, don't do it that way. That's not how it's done. But he kept getting better and better and better and they couldn't believe it until in the 1968 Olympics, he showed up and won the gold medal and broke the Olympic world record for the high jump while he was still in college. And everybody that tells this story often tells it as a story of we can do things differently, think different, be an innovator, you know, Apple logo, all that kind of stuff. But that's not what I think is exciting about this story. What's exciting about this story is that what every other competitor said when they saw Dick do this was, oh, works for Dick, but it won't work for us because Dick has different physiology, because Dick thinks differently, but we can't do it. That we have an excuse, we have a reason, we have a way of saying why we can't do it. And what is so funny about that is that no one except for one person since then has ever held the world record doing it any way other than the Fosbury flop. So it was better, but they couldn't see how it could work for them. And I see the same thing happening in the world of work today. We are confronted with enormous challenges and amazing opportunities. And all we have to do is take the moment and the opportunity to say, hey, you know what? We're going to try to do things a little differently around here. And yes, yeah, some of it's going to work, some of it's not, but we are going to become a learning machine so that it doesn't matter because we're going to get better and better and better. And we're going to keep trying things and keep adapting, tuning in to that voice in our head that says, there's something in the way of us doing our best work. And if we just try something else, we might figure out what it is. And that's what I was very happy to come here today and say, and I'm very hopeful to see what each of you does with some of the ideas that I shared here today in the year to come. So thank you. That's really awesome, Aaron. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing, at, uh, if this was a live audience, there will be like <laughs> tremendous applause. Um, <laughs> 
that's, that's the thing about working with Zoom. It's like, oh, wow, there's a lot of things going on and there's a lot of good nuggets uh, um, in I there. And I imagine the to... applause and it makes me feel better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are applause here, so don't worry. Um, there, there's so much in there and, and it re relates to a lot of what Anita was sharing earlier uh, in her speech that even for Singapore, we need to move from the idea of people, uh, process centric to really people centric. And, and that takes change, and change is sometimes hard. Um, I, 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 I laugh when you showed the example of uh, roundabouts um, and the drivers. I, the, the thing that came to my mind is I, we need to bring you to Singapore to see Newton Circus and how Singaporeans <laughs> drive. Uh, you might just change your slide on that. Uh, but we're yeah. going to come back to you. I really want to get also to our panelists uh, to share their thoughts on it. Um, I want to get back to our Zoom audience. Uh, please remember, uh, Pigeonhole is open. I know you've got lots of questions for Aaron and later on for the panelists as well. Uh, please use Pigeonhole and we'll come back uh, to the question and answer uh, after we have Haas and Vincent. So, um, lots to consider, lots to talk about. Change is often hard. I like what Aaron talked about. It's about changing the way we change. Uh, I thought that was a really good point. Um, so, shall we do the shivery thing and let ladies go first? Haas, over to you. Thank you, Martin and uh, Vincent. I'm, I'm tr and, and Aaron, truly, I'm among the chivalrous um, benefiting from these gentlemen. Uh, thank you also to Minister and Anita for the inspiring speech and NCSS for saving some space for PPIS up here. I think what Aaron has shared uh, resonated with a lot of us. Um, let me begin with a quick uh, recap of what we do at the Singapore Muslim Women Association as well as share perhaps three pointers on how the pandemic changed the way we changed. So we're almost 70 years old, the Muslim Women Association. Um, we are unwavering in our dedication towards women um, and their families and their children. Our services are largely secular and focused on these three areas. Interestingly, now that we are almost 70, um, the median age I discovered of our staff is about half of the organization, about, about 34.8, which potentially shows that we are in between generations. I won't let you guess which half am I closer to, but I'm here as a connector. <laughs> um, social services is a large part of PPIS, and we are seeing now the generation of the millennial leaders and soon to be the Gen Z leaders. So things are bound to change. Thinking is bound to change. Work is bound to change. And I think the best part about understanding change is to also understand the appetite for change. Um, how is the organization and the people that we serve responding to change and at what level are we comfortable with change and how do we become more comfortable absolutely love the um, example about the org chart and how that was from the 1900 took a century but it's still boxes and dotted lines and of course the amazing anecdote about uh, the roundabout which strikes fear in a lot of drivers hearts um, i did a quick google search about almost 2,500 traffic lights in Singapore, 50 roundabouts, so the ratio is about 1 to 50, not so much 1 to 1,000 as how it was in the United States. Um, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about the areas of how the pandemic gave us opportunities, challenges, and also offered us an opportunity to recognize the people who are serving at the front lines. I think Minister earlier mentioned how the pandemic also brought about an opportunity to tear down barriers as well as assumptions. I think one of the best uh, opportunities is actually the changing attitudes towards remote work, towards telecommuting, towards flexible work arrangement, towards working from home, working from hotel, working from shared workspaces. That is certainly um, an opportunity that I hope is not only the new normal, but also the next normal, as Anita mentioned. Um, also, the speeding up of digitalization. A lot of reports have said that people's uh, learning curve for digitization sped up by about seven years. We are ahead of that curve because we had to be, and therefore we stepped up, we become. That was also something that we discovered um, was an opportunity that the sector and PPIS certainly took advantage of. Now, in terms of challenges, we are right about one and a half years into the pandemic. So a lot of normalization has taken place, acclimatization has taken place. I think uh, I won't be alone when I say in the social services sector, some of the first few challenges um, that frontliners felt was essentially confidentiality because mm. things are now digitized and cybersecurity. Another element would be crisis management. 
Now, when you are in a shared physical space and a crisis occurs, you can immediately reach out for support. When you are in a remote location, your reaching out becomes not so immediate physically, but digital connectivity has assisted with that. Um, for example, let's talk about meeting with a client one-on-one. -on -one. It would have been just one person, one man hour meeting a client. Now, in the event that that transition is online, then you may need more than one staff. You might need a technical assistant, at least at the beginning, right? You might need um, um, some other administrative assistant to assist you in setting up and getting ready. So that was one of the change that we had to embrace because we also realized that scaling up means that you may require less man hours but have more impact because you reach more people, you reach more clients. When initially you started with needing more man hours to serve one client. So that was a transformative journey that the sector, or at least what we see at PPI has gone through as well. Another challenge, and I'm glad there's a lot of um, ground up efforts uh, to manage this, is digital divide in terms of managing the literacy and readiness of the clients that we serve, the access that they have to technology, as well as the knowledge that they have to find the help that they need. And this was one um, response that was uh, actively uh, discovered during this pandemic. Now, the last part, I think, is about recognition. Um, it is important for inter and intra department uh, recognition for us. So we had our uh, children from our children's uh, services thank our social workers to motivate them for the work that they do because these children um, were, 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 were able to appreciate uh, the, the hard work of the, the frontliners. Uh, we also supported our social workers by ensuring that they have the necessary tools and tech uh, to do their work better. Mm and also to recognize that there might be a need, you know, the help is sometimes needs help. Um, so we do offer, I think, and, and this is something um, that we're proud of, uh, support for our frontliners in terms of getting help themselves or counseling internally or externally. I'm excited to talk about the future of the unknown, really the future of work and how we innovate service delivery. I think what matters or rather what we all agree, can agree with is that the good work goes on. Social work is not a sunset industry. We are here to stay. Um, but how will we transform? And I think we talked about this, Martin, separately. Is it about helping, fixing and solving? Or is it really about equipping, involving and managing? And I like this clarification, uh, clarification or quick uh, uh, um, sharing about uh, being systems theorists. The complicated versus the complex. The complexities of the social sectors of people is something that uh, is useful for us to consider because I truly appreciate it when Aaron mentioned the importance of us being people-centric and also to understand about being people-positive and complexity-conscious. I think these two are yep. key uh, indicators. And lastly, of course, at the end of the day, all that we do and why we do what we do is motivated by intents and purposes. Thank you, Haas. Well, one of the biggest worry that we have in our sector is that we see our beneficiaries, our clients, our people uh, as problems to solve. Mm. Rather, it's really how we really look at the system as a whole. So, Vincent, I really want to go straight to you uh, for your take on it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Minister and uh, Anita, for having uh, me here today uh, and to all my friends in the social service sector. Yeah. Now, I, I want to first start with a question about... Uh, now. What is the most prized or precious asset for most of the for all charities? Think about it. It's actually our IPC status, institution of public character. Why is that important? Basically, having an IPC status would enable us to be able to fundraise, and the donors are going to get tax exemption. It is actually the privilege that is accorded to the charity. Right, or the organization, right, for having good processes in place that you have the public trust that the resources that are being channeled to you are properly dispensed, accounted for, managed, and safeguarded. Now, therein lies this conundrum, because as a charity, as you grow bigger, inevitably, the expectations are higher and the more successful you are, be it in the scale, in the reach or in the depth of your work, 
you are going to be under the spotlight. Which is why under the charity's corporate governance, code of corporate governance, there are a few tiers. The better, the bigger, the more successful you are, you're actually more regulated. Now, this then becomes a contradiction because it impinges the pressure on the organization, organization to focus a lot on, hey, let's really properly ensure that we have all the right processes in place so that we do not misplace public trust. But we know on the ground, the, especially the frontliners, they have to, they have to respond to uh, the changing needs, right? Very often. And flexibility, nimbleness, it is key. They, all these are key. So how do we find the right balance? Now, it's still something that is work in progress even for myself. Right? I want to give an example of uh, what we have experienced in last year during COVID-19. Uh, we have service users that we support and uh, over at AMK, uh, one of the group that we always uh, uh, looked after right, or pay attention to are the vulnerable group of people that are living in our community. And when COVID-19 first struck, of course, we know that uh, many of them, you know, the, they lost their income, jobs were unstable. And even when circuit breaker had happened, many of the services out there had to close. Only essential services uh, were open. It also means the old ways of how we can respond to assist our, we call them clients, uh, our beneficiaries. Uh, with financial assistance, we even have to change because the old processes of having the clients coming down um, and having financial assistance uh, you know, administered I couldn't take place anymore. So on the ground, what uh, our folks had, had very quickly thought of was, let's use the pay now system. So we empowered our centre managers uh, to be able to uh, use their pay now to pay to the beneficiaries receiving. And on the back end, the finance quickly, you know, reimbursed them. We were able to do it mainly because of two reasons. Sorry, many of the, the, the key reason is trust. It has to be two way. Firstly, the management must trust that the, the money that the person is going to transfer is to the right recipient. Then on the other hand, the the, the, for the staff who is willing to use his or her own money to, to expedite financial assistance must trust that the agency will honour and return the money to the person. So I, from this small little example, I think what he has showed is that the relationship between the the, the management and the ground, now it must be embedded in trust. Yep. And the ground must be given the autonomy, right, for them to make decisions that are most effective and most expedient. That's, mm. that's our example. You know? uh, that's what we learned that uh, how he has been very useful and, you know, yep. Yep. Now, I, I think trust is such an important part and and Aaron, I want to come back to you very quickly because uh, first and foremost, I think time is running out on us. But I really want to take you, uh, ask you for your take because one of the couple of questions that have been coming in from the pigeonhole and from our, our summit participants is really this idea of how do we build trust? I mean, change is difficult, like you said, right? Uh, it's about changing the way we change. Change is sometimes frowned upon, uh, but often forced upon us. Pandemic has forced change in a lot yeah. of, uh, of situations that we are in. Uh, but the idea of leaders needing to learn to let go, the empowerment, the flip side of it is dealing with this idea that, oh, am I losing control by 
giving uh, our, our staff on the ground, like what Vincent is talking about, um, to be empowered to do things, which is the ideal state that we want. Uh, but often for us as leaders uh, is the dealing with the fear. Uh, how do we build trust and how do we deal with that fear to be able to create this new way of thinking? Uh, is it a training uh, or like your slide, you say, is it just purely practice? But what do you practice? Yeah, so uh, three answers come to mind for me that are each very quick. The first is a saying that we use, which is act as if. So we say act as if everyone is trustworthy and ready and respectful and reliable and talented and actually see what happens. Because if everyone involved acts as if that's true, it's often surprising what occurs. What occurs is unexpected and, and often is a lot better than what we worry about in our leader minds when we're imagining all the things that can go wrong. So act as if is one. The second one is um, actually comes from a, a nuclear submarine captain that we had on the podcast who was advising us about how he learned to let go. And he said, the first thing you can do as a leader if you wanna to learn to let go is go to a restaurant and just tell the waiter, I'll have whatever you'd like me to have. And just see how that feels. Just try that on. It'll be hard enough there where it's low stakes and doesn't matter. And if you can do that, then you can probably do the next best thing at work. So being able to, to, to let go is definitely critical. And then the last step to, you know, to trust is really just realizing that that the thing you already know how to do often is, is a guide for this. So not everyone at work is a parent, but many of us are. And those of us that are parents know that if you over control and oversteer and try to make sure that no, no child ever skins their knee or ever gets hurt or ever does anything wrong, they won't actually learn to become amazing, flourishing adults. They will only become amazing adults if you give them a little bit of room to make mistakes and to learn for themselves how the world works and what's important and what matters and how to be the best them that they can be. And so I often advise folks to just like, remember, remember that, remember how you think about either how you parent or how you will parent. And remember that as a, as someone that's giving birth to an organization, you're also creating an environment for that infant and for that, you know, new thing or that thing that's changing. And you can adopt a lot of the same mindsets, which is like, we're going to have to let things go a little bit. And yes, some things will go wrong. But in the end, the benefit of those things going a little bit wrong is that they learn. The system learns and it gets smarter and smarter and more resilient. And isn't that better than a system that's totally relying on me to keep it safe all the time forever? You know, I, I personally would like to sleep in one morning. <laughs> that's true. The, the children is growing up. Let them go and let them have fun and just watch over yeah. them. Hey, Aaron, in your, your, your work- Your job is only to prevent the worst things that could happen. What are yep. the things that will kill business? Otherwise, let the that's, system that's a, learn. That's a really good frame. No, no, I, I like that frame. Uh, our job is to prevent things, bad things from happening. Um, I, but our time is running out. This counter just shouting at me that we need to wrap up. <laughs> but I do want to have one more question for you, uh, which is a lot of challenge we face on the ground. Uh, dealing with change sometimes and on multiple levels. As leaders, we have our staff. But we also have board members that we also have to lead, very senior people who don't often see things on the ground level. Uh, in your work experience, um, how do people manage change and get boards to let go and let them see that the child that they are trying to govern and, and raise is now growing up? And how, how do we build that level of trust uh, with boards uh, for leaders on, of organizations? I mean, I think it starts day one, but I find that most boards that I talk to are actually there in the mindset of, I am here to help this leader or entrepreneur or leadership team do what they're here to do on this planet. And I'm here to help in any way that I can. And they're very open to a restructuring of what kind of advice do we ask for? What kind of results do we share? What is the nature of that board you know, member conversation and, and meeting and relationship? And I think it's okay for founders to push and to say, this is what I need from you in order to achieve our purpose. And this is what I don't need. And I'd really like you to lean into that with me. And if you can't trust me in that, then maybe I'm not the right person for the job. Martin, yep. if, if, if I may add to what um, Aaron is, is talking about, is having a stake in it together, yep. right? Having a shared interest, shared vision, shared intent and shared purpose. And I think we are hearing this new word quite a lot, which is to co-create. Yes. So mm. let's talk about, we talked about um, letting the waiter serve whatever's at the restaurant, but talk about letting staff or letting teams score their own goal. 
I mean, it didn't go to home. Mm. It didn't go home. It went to Rome. But yeah. but really, it's about it's about how scoring an own goal will not be a taboo, mm. and how that could be the future. Yeah. I think that is also a consideration. And when when boards as well as management are aligned as they should be, um, the future of work is really anyone's oyster. It is one exciting <laughs> one uh, in the new normal that um, that we are going to go into. Uh, one that requires leaders, boards, staff, um, even trust being built with the service. Uh, when we do service delivery, our beneficiaries, our clients, um, it's more than just uh, ability to come up with fancy programs, uh, but rather how do we actually work together to build trust across board, trust with governments, trust with leaders, trust with our, our beneficiaries, um, and trust with our partners all across from Denver, Colorado. So, hey, Aaron, it's been a great joy uh, having you with us, with Haas and Vincent as well. Thank you so much for making time. In this new normal, uh, we are entering a time of brave new work, one that empowers people, one that's people-centric, uh, one that really brings about the best of us uh, to be able to do what we can do for the better good of our people. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Aaron, Haas, Vincent. Oh, back to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin Haas, Vincent, and Aaron, if you can still hear us. I just wanted to say this. When you showed the picture of the roundabout, instantly you brought all of us in this room and all of us who are joining by Zoom back to the day we received our driver's license and had to go to the Newton roundabout. If we had an audience here today and I asked for a show of hands, I can guarantee you 80% of the people would raise their hands if I asked how many of you couldn't get out of Newton Circus the first time you had to drive there. How many now have this, had this issue? When I first came back, I, I learned how to drive quite late in life. And when I first came back to Singapore, I could not get out of the traffic at Newton Circus. It took me like four or five rounds. So, Aaron, thank you very much. And that wasn't the only thing I remembered about your presentation, by the way. I will also thank our panel for their discussions and those of you who've managed to send in your questions to us as well. Now, for our next keynote, we're going to have uh, Lee Powa. Powa is going to share a hack how to hack the social service ecosystem. Uh, Powa is the CEO of the Lien Foundation, where he developed the grant-making approach of radical philanthropy, something for us to really have a think about. And Powa will be sharing a glimpse of his playbook for hacking philanthropy, professional practices, and also paradigms in the social service. And after the sharing, we're also invited Dr. Christian Chow. Christian, uh, Mr. I'm sorry I promoted you, but it's okay. One day you'll get your PhD and you'll be a doctor. <laughs> this is a glimpse into the future, Christian. You never know since we're talking about reimagining. Uh, Christian will be facilitating a dialogue with Powa. Christian is the Senior Director of Corporate Development and Operations at Care Corner Singapore. Now again, Again, a reminder, if you have questions, and you will have, please post them all on the pigeonhole Q&A, all right? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Li Powa. Thank you, Susan. A very good morning. Uh, a brave new work requires the courage to change. Bravery is a quality, but courage is a choice. The opposite of courage is not cowardice. It is actually conformity. Uh, hack care is the operative phrase at the foundation in the last couple of years. Uh, it's not that we are bought up, but we de made deliberate efforts to break the chains of conformity. So let me illustrate with a few examples uh, from our ecosystem. This is a brand new hospice day centre delivered by a very capable SSA. We have not made public, is it? but in a way this is a preview, especially for you all. Uh, 900 square meter space at a community hospital that was inspired by Club Med. So in fact, we got an architect, a design company, both of them are President De Design Award winners, to help us to reimagine the space, the processes and the rituals. Uh, let me take you on a tour, maybe starting from the top left, uh, top left hand corner itself. Uh, when you enter, a cafeteria greets you. It's very spacious and you can notice that there are industrial oven, coffee machines because they are going to conduct 
baking and barista lessons. There's a watering hole that's going to serve alcohol. In fact, we, they got a volunteer mixologist to advise on a setup. They will concord their own signature cocktails. Uh, the clients will also be able to make potted plants for hanging inside the greenhouse. Uh, you see a salon whereby they will offer hairdressing and massage services, a cinema. This facility is at, actually intergen. They'll be also taking care of uh, kids who, have, who are terminally ill. So on the bottom, you notice that there's a hoist system that's able to wheel the children into the uh, spa next door eh, for them to enjoy the services. There is uh, dental services provided by volunteers and there's also uh, actually a mahjong room eh, uh, hidden behind a movable bookshelf. Actually, they wanted to bring in jackpot machines but unfortunately it was not allowed. The designers also came up with uh, two kits to foster end-of-life conversation uh, and they have a dedicated space, very warm in a way to be able to enable the whole thing. The magic cupboard is actually mobile. Eh? The intent was to, uh, to, to get the staff to be able to wheel and deliver all the fun activities and surprises. So exceptional job that was uh, done by the SSA leader. I must thank the CEO and the medical director and the team, together with the creatives. You see. So um, the clients will be able to get the engagement, the quality of life, and the uh, caregivers the necessary respect. And let me just give a final reminder. This is actually a hospice. It's not a resort. But we want to make sure it's good enough for our mom, our dad, and for ourselves. Jade Circle, this is actually a four-story building located within the Peace Haven Nursing Home. Uh, only single and twin rooms, all en suite. A view of the rooms and the cosy residential living area that will be shared by about 11 residents. Is it? So I think COVID has been a game changer to show that nursing home space and privacy is actually not a luxury but a necessity, especially when it comes to taking care of uh, clients living with dementia and for infection control purposes. And we actually made a comparison also. In terms of operational costs, uh, it's not much different compared to running a four-bedded dorm. Uh, and in a way, Peace Haven also, in terms of pricing, it's only about 10% extra for a single room compared to the dorms itself. There are two stories that's dedicated to a special senior day facility. Uh, as you can see down there, lots of fun, engaging, and purposeful activities. And my fundamental belief is still uh, the best way to save manpower and to enhance productivity is to get seniors to do things for themselves. Give them responsibility, give them choice, give them autonomy, give them a sense of purpose and accomplishment. Again, wonderful learning journey, thanks to the strong leadership from Milan and the team. I think a lot of SSAs will be quite familiar with gym tonic. This is uh, our high-tech strength training system that is safe and simple to use for seniors. Uh, what we did was to bring concepts from high-performance sports combined with big data, combined with design to transform senior exercises, to make it more club-like, to, to, to motivate seniors. We started in nursing homes, but five years ago, we decided to move 100% upstream to focus on seniors in the community before they become too disabled. And without a doubt, there's already sufficient evidence uh, that strength training will, uh, in a way, Jim Tony is able to strengthen the seniors, and we have shown cases whereby we can even reverse frailty. Uh, 20, we have about 28 sites all over the island itself. Pre-COVID, there are 6,000 active users. Right now, about 1,005. They are all coming back. Is it? And more than 100 of them are 90 years and above. In fact, we've got three ladies above 100 years old. The oldest is Madam Han from Monfort, 103 years old. Second is Madam Lao Sun Xiang from Care Corner, 102 this year. So my conclusion is, men is definitely the weaker sex. This is our new project at a museum to make it senior and dementia friendly. You'll be ready by the end of the year. Uh, yeah, this is like a, a charming 300 square meter social space, especially for seniors and those living with dementia. 
and, they, and we are going to create a lot of curated special programs harnessing the heritage resources of the museum and technology to engage seniors. Food is a big part of our heritage and it will also be a big feature uh, in this centre. It is also connected to a brand new cafe. There will be, in a way, all the staff will be trained to handle the seniors uh, and folks living with dementia. So our aspiration is that one day, the geriatrician and all the clinicians out there, they would actually prescribe museum visits to rehabilitate uncle, auntie, you know, or to get seniors to be more active. A busy slide showcasing the Lian Foundation's ecosystem of uh, education projects, mainly in preschools. In fact, a number of these projects, we drew inspiration from hospice, adopting a holistic approach whereby we get teachers, social workers, therapists, healthcare professionals, and community partners to provide wrap-around services to address the complex needs of children and their clients. So we have a big coalition, many SSA out there, but we all do recognize that education cannot be solved by schools alone, in the same way that health problems cannot be tackled adequately by hospitals. Right now, I think there are, the way I look at the whole system and landscape, there are four siloed education systems. Preschools, early intervention, mainstream primary schools, and SPED. And I must acknowledge that uh, MSF and EGDA, I think they have done tremendous work in the last couple of years to better integrate preschools and early intervention. Because after all, um, I do think that the boundaries can be made more porous and how can we actually bridge all these silos with the care profession because there are common values, skills and best practices that can be shared. So we may be all wearing different professional lens, it's all about learning to work together to better serve our clients. You see. Uh, I think more work needs to be done downstream in our primary schools. You see. So right now, I would say that MSF and uh, MOH, you know, wow, they have great chemistry. But MOE somehow is still a bit lukewarm you see, about getting social workers, healthcare and allied health to work inside their primary schools. Now, increased longevity will fundamentally change our current notions about education, work, relationship, and even money. You know, in, 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 uh, it will impact all of us and society in profound ways. So, healthcare spending is already going to triple by the end of this decade. In fact, many children who are born today, they will live to above 100 years old, the majority of them. But that's, that's the nature of, uh, of progress, you see. And Singapore has one of the highest life expectancy, 85 years old. But what is alarming is that 11 of those years are actually spent in poor health. And this figure is actually growing proportionally faster. The current paradigm that we have in our health and care uh, sectors is reactive sick care. You wait for somebody to get dementia, stroke, and cancer, then you go and seek treatment. Very often, it's too little, too late, is it? Maybe I pose a scenario. If today, there is a Parma company, you know, if they created a magic pill to be able to cure all cancer, all cancers, human life expectancy will only increase by three years. Is it? The reason is that because there are many other kind of diseases and disorders all lining up. You can wage war on cancer, you can wage the war on diabetes, but the reality is that age is the single biggest risk factor for all the big killers, chronic diseases, disability, and even COVID deaths worldwide. Uh, and in terms of, I, I would say that uh, as a society, much thought and investment has gone into the physical infrastructure and social programs, but not enough has gone into in terms of how to leverage biomedical application to target biological aging itself. So I think there's a need to shift our gaze upstream, change some of our paradigms and approaches. Yeah, because in the last two decades, there has been great advances to understand and decode the biology of aging. Actually, what I'm saying is that actually, Biological age can be measured. You may be 50 years old, but your biological age may be like 65 because you led an abusive lifestyle. And they can be targeted with lifestyle intervention, 
uh, drugs, supplements, and other therapeutics. Is it? What I'm saying is that aging actually is malleable, is hackable. And the paradigm maybe we can aspire towards is one of preventive, personalized, and predictive, uh, delivered with greater precision. But put it in very simple English, is how can we improve the way we grow old to slow down biological aging and to compress the period that's spent in poor health? Sounds like a moonshot. But if you are able to do it well, we will prevent diseases, dementia, admission to hospitals, nursing homes, suffering. It will be an economic and quality of life victory. So I think there are opportunities to leverage the conversions of medicine, biotech, AI, big data, for us to hack aging, dementia, depression, child development, autism, whatever is your pet cost. The foundation is walking the talk with two initiatives. This one is really uh, a number of clinical trials in the community involving big cohorts. One is to hack aging and the other one is to hack dementia itself. The emphasis here is that we want to measure everything, collect lots of data. You also notice that a lot of all these e-commerce companies and, and uh, even digital companies, they know you better than you know yourself. Is it? So we will measure yeah, your brain age, even on your DNA mutilation age, uh, all this inflammation. Uh, and we are even working with scientists from China, whereby they have algorithms. Is it? Based on the scan of your face, they can actually predict your age. Uh, omics technology of will be involved, uh, all putting together. But the end game is that we wanted to develop a powerful biomarker platform so that we can accurately measure biological age to enable early detection and re-stratification of dementia. The, 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 the cohort that we are looking at are those who are 30 to 50 years. You know, because once you are diagnosed with dementia, there's no cure. Eh? Go upstream as early as possible. Big coalition behind the whole thing, we have all the national clinical and research institution uh, with participation from many private companies. Sounds like science fiction, but let me bring you to China, whereby they have took it to another level. Food security is actually a paramount issue in a country that has to feed 1.4 billion people. And China has the biggest pig farming industry. They supply 50%, is it? more than 300 million pigs. But they have been like using facial recognition technology, whether it's using a phone or using 3D cameras to be able to identify each of these pigs, that you are using other monitoring technology to track the vital signs and the behavior. The intent is to detect disease, track their health and prescribe intervention. And the long-term goal is, is there a way to reduce the risk of epidemic to enhance productivity. Not just livestock productivity, but manpower productivity. And there's also advantage in terms of improving insurance processing. Think about it, you know, the, the insurance fraud cases all come down. See? Because right now, each of these pigs can be identified. You cannot play play. Yeah. So not surprisingly, all the big boys, the big companies, Alibaba, Huawei, uh, Pingan Insurance is the, is the world's biggest insurance company. But I see them as a technology company. They have 30,000 researchers, 120,000 technologists, all working with farmers, all sorts of livestock. Believe it or not, uh, five years ago, JD.com, Jingdong, they placed free-range chicken on the blockchain five years ago. This is, sounds a bit crazy, but you notice on the photograph that the chicken are actually having some anklets out. It's a wearable. Yeah, it's a wearable. So I'm not too sure whether is it if, you are, if the chicken takes one million steps, then this one will be a healthy chicken. And the supermarkets, all the big ones in, in China right now, uh, more than 25% of all their products, they already place them on the blockchain to have like immutable, complete visibility of the entire supply chain because their intent is always about food safety. Food safety is another major issue uh, the Chinese want to tackle. Uh, for end consumers, of course, with the scan or using their phone itself, they will know the origin story of your super chicken. Runaway success, I think they are trying out with swimming duck and flying pigeons. So China, I think they are able to make great leaps in many domains. And the way I look at it is that because of the convergence of three factors. One, because of bold government targets, guidelines, 
an investment. They put money where their mouth is. Second is the rising consumer expectation. The Chinese, in fact, I will say they are much more demanding than us Singaporeans when it comes to the quality of the products and services. And lastly, the companies there are able to seize the opportunity and by embedding superior technology to transform the industry. So although we are the social services sector, uh, relatively small, but I think we play a critical role in the care economy. We need to work hard to learn from other industries and countries. Five points for you to take away. Bureaucracies traditionally value uniformity, order and efficiency. You know, uh, look at the minimal differences among our nursing home or even the schools. We need to balance it up with values of variety, flexibility, agility and creativity because these are really these values will be increasingly vital in institutions of care and learning. Think about it, if you're a student or a senior, what are the values to, that you want this organization to, to, to embrace? Uh, and as a sector, traditionally, we drew inspiration from the social sciences, the humanities, and businesses. Uh, we need to augment it by embracing design, technology, the sciences, and the arts. Be like Leonardo. Yeah, so you are able to see things differently only if you, are, you, if you see many things and you try many things yourself. Now, Singapore is a, got zero natural resources, a small population base. From the get-go, I think our country has to work damn hard to make Singapore an open, attractive, and user-friendly platform and ecosystem for economic activities and innovation. Um, you and I, whether you are SSA, a foundation, uh, NCSS, or the ministry, all of us got ecosystem of varying sizes, diversity, and quality. Singapore is a garden city, a city in a garden. I'm a peasant and proud of it, is it? But I think I'm a farmer working inside a foundation. Actually, what I'm trying to say is that all of us need to cultivate and grow our own ecosystem so that we can better produce and feed our mission. You may be in social services, but I think it's always good to think like an economic agency. How can we attract and create value? Not just social, but economic value. To expand your ecosystem, uh, explore possible roles within national initiatives. They have bigger agenda, bigger budget, bigger capabilities. For example, the RIE 2025 that was announced this year, this is a national master plan for research, innovation, and enterprise. They set aside $25 billion over five years. And one of their priority is how to transform human health and how to advance human potential. They cannot do preventive and population health effectively without bridging the last mile, which many of you have access to. Yeah, so what about the Child and Maternal Health Task Force, which is chaired by Minister, the Singapore Green Plan 2030, Smart Nation Initiative, all these AI and blockchain ecosystems out there. Are we on their radar screen? And let me end by saying that to reimagine the sector, we need to first reimagine our relationships. Our relationships with clients, with colleagues internally and externally, with the government, with funders, with technology, with the notion of risk. Because progress is not just about narrowing gaps. It's also about having the courage to open new portals of possibility. So let us um, work together to open new doors. Thank you. OK, th thanks, uh, Poa, for that very uh, thought-provoking, you know, and yet, um, a, a real vision of what's truly possible. I mean, the, the theme of uh, the summit is uh, reimagining social sector. And I think for you, you've clearly, clearly reimagined, you know, uh, what social services can do. Um, I'm from Care Corner. We've been around for 40 years. And I think even as we look ahead, it's, it's a really exciting period for the social services. Um, and I think as you have shared, uh, one of the key ways in which we can start reimagining ourselves is to take a more multi disciplinary approach uh, to, do, to the way we work, right? 
Um, so maybe I'll just jump into to maybe the first question that I wanted to really ask you. And, and because of your experience just working with uh, many different projects, collaborating with uh, very diverse you know, disciplines, professions, uh, partners, uh, groups of people, um, it can be actually quite complex, you know, navigating this myriad of uh, different stakeholders, interests, agendas. I, I just wanted your take, you know, how do you go about having to work with so many different uh, parties? And I think this is also relevant for SSAs as we approach, uh, you know, um, trying to figure out how can we be more impactful as a system, right? And not just operate as an agency. Yeah. I always adopt a constructivist approach. Uh, that meaning to say I, I learn by doing, exploring and experimenting. So I apply that when it comes to working with partners, with people, or adopting many different approaches, approaches within our ecosystem. Uh, in fact, for the last, consistently for the last five years, you know, uh, the foundation have more than 100 active institutional partners, meaning to say we have ongoing projects that are working together. 50% of them are non-profit, 20% are public uh, institutions like hospitals and university, and 30% are from the private sector. And majority of them, they are like designers, the architects, the creative and the artists, because I like to work together with them. And more than one quarter of these relationships are more than 10 years. Uh, what, I think, what, what I'm trying to say is that, in fact, I, I still remember our first project is with Peace Haven, 2005. That was my maiden project into elder care. And we are still continuing to do business together, learning and growing together. I, all, I don't forget where we came from. You see, and I, we, we always cherish good people. Because after all, Philanthropy is a process of finding great people, giving them the space, the courage, and the resources to do great things. Yeah. Uh, because the nature of business is that our network is our net worth. <laughs> At the same time, it's also our knowledge database. It's a collective knowledge and implementation vehicle. Right. And this one may sound very daunting, is it? but I think I have learned over the years how to have a comfortable and creative relationship with complexity and ambiguity. Don't can chong, yeah. yeah. So don't be too quick to also like jump to conclusions. Uh, let the things work, work out itself. Mm. And, and make effort, make effort to really understand the partners and the people behind them, what motivates them. Even like yeah. Care Corner, you know. Uh, Paul King was joking with me that in a way, I met up with his colleagues, you know, I had lunch more than him, you see. So I said it's a privilege <laughs> to be able to do so, just to... to to know what makes everybody tick. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, uh, Paul. And I can uh, attest to that. I think uh, even though we've only known each other for maybe uh, slightly over a year, uh, had very good lunch conversations with yourself. Um, I think one of the other things that, um, you know, in managing, I guess, um, systems and, you know, um, I guess the polarities involved in, in longer-term relationships is that, you know, a lot of the, the value and the impact we see sometimes comes when you have that relationship, that trust that's being built over time. Um, but yet, at the same time, in order to deal with the complexity and the uncertainty, we need to create, I guess, smaller, uh, agile-type experiments, you know, um, ways of doing things where we don't have to wait so long in order to see some kind of uh, results. Now, how do you balance that? You know, being a foundation, I'm sure accountability is important, making sure that the funds are being channeled to the right places. How do you balance this thing about longer term, you know, interest and investments versus, you know, smaller agile type yeah, projects? Yeah. yeah. I think one of the paradox of uh, being older when you have less time on earth, I, I, I've come to be a bit more patient also. And I also recognize that in a lot of our work, all these important causes, they take time. Things take time to change. Yeah. But maybe also to share some of our views in terms of uh, philanthropy, how I, how I approach the whole thing itself. First and foremost is that in our nature of work, uh, it's influenced by many, many, many things. Many players, many events, many uh, forces at work that interact in mysterious ways. So you cannot actually pinpoint a causative link, is it? And because of that, you can't precisely plan for, for it. So I, 
personally, I don't believe in silver bullet. Hmm. Uh, no magical intervention that's highly measurable itself. So instead, I adopt a contribution mindset rather than an attribution mindset itself. Right. Because ultimately, it's a relational enterprise. I have to work with people and through people itself to make things happen. Um, so again, I, I, I don't believe in all this. Uh, I'm not blinded by all these logic models and KPI, you know, if that's yeah. what you are asking, is it? Because first and foremost, in any practice, whether it's philanthropy or social services, don't over-intellectualize mm. philanthropy, is it? Yeah. Mm. Uh, because even you talk about all these logic models and KPI, there's just no evidence, absolutely no evidence out there that this is a superior way of doing right. things, is it? Yeah. In a way, it's about trial and error, constructivist approach, you know, become an iterative process. I love what you just shared because it links very well with what Aaron shared earlier about the traffic light versus the roundabout, you know, and sometimes KPIs might give some level of uh, comfort and assurance uh, to individuals, right? You know, because, okay, it's this uh, metric that I can see. Yeah. Uh, but yet, sometimes you do need that roundabout approach where it's a bit more enabling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, the KPI, in fact, that I look at is, even I, for my staff, is it, I'm, I'm looking at how often you have a conversation with your partners? How often mm. you pick up a phone to have a frank talk to resolve uh, challenges? Is it? And personally, running, let's say, a, a, a foundation, I'm annoyed by people you know, who likes to create complication and complexity right. just because they think they are professional or serious. Yeah. The thing on my mind is always, these are my customers, the partners. How can I add value to you? Yeah, very nice. Um, it's really unfortunate that we know, I think we are uh, kind of running out of time. Um, and this uh, summit, I think we've heard so much rich, you know, insights, sharings, a lot to think about, you know, from uh, what uh, Minister shared, you know, to what uh, Anita, uh, Anita shared, as well as Aaron. Um, maybe with, with all that in mind, I just wanted to ask you one last question. And, and really it is a, 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 maybe your, your take on what would be one practical step that all of us can take, you know, um, even tomorrow? I mean, something really concrete, easy to do, but that step that will allow us to maybe move closer, you know, towards that vision of a more reimagined uh, social uh, service sector. Yeah. I, I, I like to lead a simple I mean, you're looking for a simple answer, but unfortunately, there's none. Is it? I like to lead a simple life, but somehow, I find that the universe has this propensity to pull you in many directions <laughs> or, or more complication and complexity. Uh, but that's entropy, you know, the second law of thermodynamics. Is, but if there's, if there's uh, some advice or, or recommendation, again, it's a corroborating to in terms of some of these messages has been shared earlier. Mm. Focus on two things. I like to build two things. One is to build quality relationship that's based on trust. Secondly is to build your knowledge outside of your small social services bubble. If you are able to do so, then you bring your ideas and influence, uh, you bring your ideas and resources into that relationship to yield more impact mm -hmm. and influence. Because why, why this uh, fixation with relationship and trust? You know, think about it. You may be the, more, the smartest, the most capable, the most well-endowed, most powerful individual or organization, but nothing else matters if people don't trust you. If they know that you won't care for them, if they know that you will sabo them, if you're not uh, creating a lot of complication without va adding value, if the, you know, only know how to take without giving, without acknowledging, people won't do business with you long term. Yeah. So I think quality relationships and trust, these are the underlying foundation mm. for strong societies, organisation. Yeah. And maybe also another final takeaway is that if there are folks out there who is living in the future, you've got some profound mm. insights and ideas, please get in touch with me. Yeah. Uh, if you feel that we share the same spiritual and work alignment, because I like serendipity, I like ambiguity, I actually make time for that, is it? because you, you don't know what sort of opportunities will pop up from such conversations. Very nice. Thanks, thanks uh, Poa, for, for sharing that. And I think with that, you know, um, as we reimagine the social sector, Let's remember to bring the social back into the sector. You know, let's go out there, meet someone, someone different, right? Someone from maybe even uh, a different sector, uh, from a different discipline, and from there, be able to start really truly reimagining how we can deliver services better.
Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Boa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Poa. And thank you very much, Christian. Very inspiring presentation and discussion. And I think I've got to hack my own life and hack aging because you know what? Now I'm striving to hit 103 and still be able to visit the gym. Ah, <laughs> may not happen. Uh, before we continue, I do have to say this before I wait right until the end. Those of you who are watching us, via Zoom and also in this room, you'll see two interpreters who have been working really, really hard this morning. I would like to just take a few moments to applaud them. Muhammad Azam and Shume. They're standing on my right, on your left. So thank you both, Azam and Shume. You've worked really, really hard. Okay, so uh, there are questions that perhaps have not been answered that you've sent through via pigeonhole. So we will get to those questions, rest assured, and NCSS will respond to all of them after today's summit. We're going to take a five minute break now, so we encourage you to maybe get up, stretch your legs, but come back to us in five minutes when the summit will continue. Thank you.
everyone, welcome back. I hope you've managed to get up, stretch your legs for a little bit and come back and join us for the rest of the summit. And at this point, I would like to invite Ms. Tan Lee San, who is the CEO of the National Council of Social Service to address us, Lee San. Thank you very much. A very good morning, Ms. Anita Pham, President and CSS, friends and colleagues. Thank you for joining us today. I am so glad we are able to hold the Social Service Summit this year, and it was such a privilege listening to all our inspiring speakers and panelists this morning. The summit gives us an opportunity to renew our shared vision for the sector. I think you will agree with me that our speakers and panelists have given us much food for thought as we come together to reimagine our sector going forward. In my presentation, I will share details of the announcements built on the themes uh, that we heard this morning and also set the stage for the breakout sessions that will follow after this. We all heard many reasons why we need to reimagine the social service sector and we are all familiar with these trends. Social needs will continue to grow along with expectations of how services are delivered. The workforce is changing and organisations are evolving. Advances in technology will change the way we work enabling us to deliver services better and potentially reach more users. Donors' expectations and giving behaviour are evolving. The NVPC did a Futures of Giving study recently, and they found that there's greater interest in impact-driven impact giving, and at the same time, corporates are reviewing their purpose and more keen to pursue social goals. With growing awareness of social issues, we have seen a rise in community-led giving and more ground-up initiatives. All these trends point to the need for us to re-examine the way we work, ride on technology to deliver greater impact, and forge partnerships within and outside the sector. In the midst of all these longer-term trends, COVID-19 threw up its own set of challenges for our social service agencies. However, as the opening video showed, SSAs did not see these as just problems, but opportunities to do things differently, and they responded with creativity and resilience. The Beyond COVID-19 Task Force convened last year by NCSS identified five domains as potential areas to transform, digitalization, manpower, funding sustainability, service delivery, and leadership. And the Emerging Stronger Together Guide produced by the task force describes the gaps and opportunities in each of these domains and identifies medium to longer term issues that we need to address as a sector. Which is why it is timely for us to refresh the 4ST and review our priorities for the next five years and beyond. The 4ST vision, ensuring every person empowered to live with dignity in a caring and inclusive society, remains as valid today as when it was launched five years ago. The three thrusts continue to provide a useful frame. But in the spirit of reimagining the sector, we will be discussing at the breakout sessions later whether these thrusts might need to be expanded and also want to hear your ideas on the content within each of these thrusts. In some of my slides, you will see at the bottom right uh, a little box with questions, and these are the questions that we will also uh, be talking about later at the breakout sessions. In the meantime, using this frame, let me just share on some of the initiatives that we can expect in the coming year. On the first thrust on empowering individuals, families, and communities, through NCSS research on societal trends and observations of social needs on the ground, we've identified three service priorities that we will be paying closer attention to in the coming year. Helping families who find themselves in a cycle of social disadvantage break out of it. Uplifting persons with mental health conditions to achieve empowerment and social inclusion and supporting caregivers to manage their caregiving responsibilities and care for themselves as well. In each of these areas, we have been working with stakeholders. I will not go into specific programs here, but just want to highlight that one key feature of all of these is to increase empowerment of these communities so that they can have a voice and play a part in improving their own lives. Empowerment requires us to see service users as participants and contributors, not just passive recipients of care or problems, as we heard this morning. We can help them identify and build on their strengths so that they can take charge of their lives and improve their well-being. The 2018 Social Service Sector Survey conducted by NCSS showed that half of our SSAs wanted to improve the way you co-create solutions with service users. 
With that in mind, NCS has developed the Empowerment Guide, which we are launching today. The guide will help SSAs assess the extent to which your users have already been participating in the design and delivery of services, identify barriers to empowerment so that you can overcome them, and design better solutions and programs. Practicing empowerment is not without its challenges, so it is encouraging to know that there are SSAs who have overcome these challenges and embraced empowerment in your work. And the guide showcases some of these, including ADA's Voices for Hope program, Rainbow Centre's Connected Communities, among others. Moving on to the second thrust on building strong social purpose entities. This morning, Minister reminded us of the SSA 3.0 vision. Erin Dignan also spoke about the importance of reinventing organisations and spurring continuous participatory change. The Community Capability Trust, CCT, announced in last year's budget was designed to build the capability and capacity of SSAs. The government, along with the TOAD board, has provided significant injection of funds into the CCT and will also be matching donations raised for dollar for dollar. We hope that donors who take a long-term view and appreciate the importance of capacity building will step up to contribute to the CCT. Our experience in the last year has shown the critical importance of organisational capacity in SSAs. Through the CCT, we want to support more SSAs build up organisational strengths so that they can better meet the needs of service users today while anticipating and preempting the problems that we will face tomorrow. The first tranche of the CCT will be open for application from April next year, and we want to take an integrated approach in building cap capability using service priorities as one lens to identify the capacities that the sector and individual SSAs need to develop most urgently. To do this, we will use the organisational development framework as a base. Every SSA is at a different stage of development and will have a different transformation journey. We have developed an OD self-assessment tool to enable SSAs to assess your own strengths and areas of development. Having identified gaps, SSAs can then tap on the CCT to address them or start a conversation with your funders and stakeholders on the support that you need. The tool will also allow SSAs to track your organisational health over time. Both the OD framework and self-assessment tool will be found in the OD guidebook, which we will be publishing next month. The guide will also point to resources to help SSAs build up your capability with recommended strategies, structures, processes to strengthen your organisation. As needs grow and the nature of work changes, SSAs have found that they can effectively augment manpower capabilities by harnessing the skills and expertise of corporate and community volunteers. In the last year, NCSS has rolled out several programs to help SSAs better manage their volunteers, including our VM toolkit and enhanced VM funding scheme. Another resource you can expect soon is the learning and development roadmap for VM practitioners. The roadmap sets out skills development pathways so that VM practitioners can identify the skills and competencies they need, you need, and plan career in the sector. This will be launched in August at our VM Network session, so do look out for it. The past year showed us how critical technology and digitalization are for SSAs. Technology can help us all work smarter and serve users better. As Minister said, being high-tech can in fact enable us to be more high-touch. And indeed, we saw much interest from SSAs in adopting technology, and this was definitely a silver lining of COVID. NCSS launched our Tech & Go one-stop tech hub to make it easier for SSAs to identify and adopt technologies. We curated digital training for leadership, managerial and operational levels. And putting all of that into a systematic, comprehensive roadmap, we launched this morning the Industry Digital Plan for the Social Service Sector in consultation with our advisory panel. With this IDP, we hope to help SSAs answer questions like, where do we start? What areas do we focus tech adoption on? How might we use tech to better empower our users? And what funding and resources are available? The IDP has several components. SSAs can make use of the digital roadmap assessment. It's a simple survey to evaluate where you are in terms of your systems, infrastructure, data proficiency, capabilities. Having done that, the tech adoption roadmap will point you to foundational, intermediate, or advanced solutions appropriate for your level of tech maturity and the subsector you are in. 
finally, you can look to the Digital Skills Guide to identify the capabilities you need for the different types of workforce you have. The IDPSS also highlights sector-wide shared platforms you can connect to. They are platforms that either already exist today or are in development, including, for example, SSNet, Social Service Navigator, SG Cares, Digital Kampong. As smart SSAs use these common platforms, we can also link up data, enable SSAs to work together to plan programs as a sector. This will allow us to move from being program-centric to person-centric, a key shift that Anita described earlier. In conjunction with the launch of the IDPSS, we have a tech showcase that's happening, I think, right now, featuring more than 50 technologies and digital solutions. They range from solutions that can help you improve productivity to technologies that enable you to provide smart services and a seamless experience for your service users. Just to give you a sense, there are some examples in the slide. Tetsuyu Cares is a case management platform that can automate case management, reduce documentation, enable multidisciplinary collaboration. This platform has the added advantage of being integrated with AIC systems. Milo is a chatbot that combines psychiatry, psychology principles, along with AI and predictive psychology algorithms to interact with persons seeking help on mental health issues. To conclude the segment on building strong social purpose entities, let me just talk briefly about strengthening board leadership. Many of our speakers this morning have spoken about this, and this will be a key focus for NCSS in the coming year. Anita spoke about the importance of having board members who can bring diverse knowledge and experience, understand intricacies and challenges of our sector, and work in alignment and with mutual trust with management on organizational goals and strategy and to achieve the future of work, as we heard this morning. So strengthening boards will be a key priority, and we will be working with various partners, CMPL, Singapore Institute of Directors, Charity Council, to enhance capabilities of board members, identify and make available board diagnostic tools, ensure a good pipeline of high caliber and diverse capabilities of board members, and also increase engagement and networking opportunities to build a strong ecosystem of support among board leaders. And that brings me to the third thrust, final thrust, of building an impactful social service ecosystem. We need good data. Poa talked about wanting to collect lots of data. We need good data to measure our impact to service users and the sector. To that end, NCSS had developed a sector evaluation framework to provide a common language for all of us, SSA, service users, funders, government, to use when we talk about impact. I think most of SSAs that we spoke to want to use evaluation tools to improve your programs and better serve your users. So the evaluation framework will have two layers. The first layer is at the program level, where SSAs can tap on a metrics bank to select outcome indicators that are most relevant for your programs. The second layer is at the sector level, where we want to measure service users' quality of life, or QOL. Using a QOL perspective will allow us to take a person-centric approach to evaluation and allows us to track users' quality of life over time. So we will be holding a briefing in a few weeks' time. Consultations will start with NCSS-funded programs as a start that are due for renewal because this is a natural point uh, to renew and review outcome indicators. And we want to work with all of you uh, to trial this framework and make sure it works for you. So the idea is for the whole sector eventually to adopt an evaluation framework. So do reach out to us if you'd like to be part of this conversation to help shape the framework. This is just one part of a larger effort to strengthen research and evaluation capabilities of our sector. We will be rolling out capability building programs, connecting interested SSAs with research institutions, and also putting out more research content that SSAs can use. This morning, Poa spoke about innovation in the sector and experimenting with new ways of doing things. As we adopt that mindset shift of moving from program-centric to person-centric, we can make use of design thinking as an approach to innovation. And NCSS has been advocating design thinking for many years now. Earlier in the year, we shared out our social innovation starter kit, which contains design thinking tips and tools to guide SSAs on how you can use person-centered design processes to create sustainable solutions. 
And this toolkit also emphasizes the importance of collaboration and bringing in perspectives of different stakeholders. And this is a key principle also behind our Singapore Together Alliance for Action. And NCSS is currently working closely with SG Enable on the AFA to strengthen support for caregivers of persons with disability. We do hope to promote much stronger partnership and collaboration. Anita spoke about the shift from a fundraising to a philanthropic mindset and the need to take a longer term systems view and work across boundaries, whether it's organizational boundaries or sector boundaries. And different stakeholders have different strengths and assets to offer. Businesses can provide time, talent, experiences, resources to address the organizational challenges within SSAs. And this was demonstrated in the New Hope JP Morgan partnership, which we saw in the video earlier. Um, many others, foundations, research institutions, bring other valuable expertise, and we hope to help forge more cross-sector collaborations that can help the social service ecosystem become a much more dynamic one. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. I would love to invite all of you to share your thoughts um, in our breakout segment. The questions that are on this slide are just some of the key ones we have identified. Uh, we hope you can share with us your perspectives on these and any other issues that you think are important for the sector to contemplate together as we reimagine the social service sector together. Let us just take a moment to pledge to commit to reimagine the social service sector together. Those of you who are on our summit platform or Facebook Live, there are reaction icons that you see at the bottom that you can click to signal your support. Thank you all for your responses and a very big thank you for your partnership as we work towards our collective vision of building a caring and inclusive society. And I wish you all a fruitful discussion in the breakout sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lee San. Also very heartening to note that you've pledged your commitment to journey together as we reimagine the social service sector. Now, also, there are many questions that have been posed to us by, uh, <coughs> excuse me, via the uh, pigeonhole Q&A. Uh, NCSS will get to your questions and will be providing you the answers after the summit is over. And for those of you who've signed up to attend the various breakout sessions, please do proceed to join the breakout rooms now. In the old normal, I would say, everybody get up and go find your rooms. But now, I would just say, go to the agenda page, and you will be able to see the breakout track. And you just need to click on the track that you've signed up for. Uh, before we go, though, we just also want to say that for those of you who aren't able to join us for the breakout sessions, please do take a couple of minutes to fill up the feedback form, and you can scan the QR code that you can see on the screen. So this is just for us to be able to know how you've liked today's session and how we can do better the next time. And really, before I go, I would just like to, you can't see us and what's going on in the background for those of you who are joining us virtually, but I do want to say thank you to the NCSS staff and the number of crew who are here to make this virtual conference something that you can all enjoy, that you can all take part in. And you know, we do hope that you will enjoy the breakout session. So again, kudos to the team at NCSS, to the crew who are here, and to the two sign interpreters who've worked extremely hard today, Muhammad Azam and Shumei. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you all for being such a fabulous virtual audience. And hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to see each other face to face, hopefully before too long. Thank you very much, and do enjoy the rest of the the summit and the program today.
A very good afternoon to friends from social service sector and community partners. I'm Jason from National Council of Social Service. Delegates who have been with us since morning, welcome back. For those who are just coming specially for this segment, welcome. I'm pleased to present to you our panel discussion on the reality of tomorrow, becoming a smart SSA. Before we begin the session proper, here are some administrative matters. Your mic and videos will be off throughout the session. Please note that the chat function has been disabled. You may put your questions in pigeonhole at the side of your screen, which will be addressed after the panel discussion. You may also upload questions that are of interest to you. To give others a chance to ask, please keep the one to two questions per person. Last but not least, please note that the session will be recorded and broadcasted via YouTube. Without further ado, let me pass the time over to our moderators, Eugenia and Bruce, to bring you through this inspiring panel discussion. Bruce, please. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jezel. Uh, okay, so um, I'll briefly introduce myself. I've introduced myself this morning for those of you who are with us this morning. Uh, my name is Bruce. I'm the Director of Sector Digitalization and Transformation in NCSS. So if, if, you, if there's nothing that you take away from this morning session, I hope you took away the launch of the Industry Digital Plan for Social Services because uh, that really is, is uh, what, what the team does like, to help the social service sector digitalize. But, but of course, you know, that shouldn't be the only thing. I personally took away quite a lot of things from the panelists and the speakers this morning. I hope it's not information overload, but I, I'll just share with you uh, two things I took away. One is, uh, is, is from Aaron Dignan. So he mentioned uh, the example or analogy about uh, a roundabout versus traffic lights. A roundabout really personifies uh, kind of trust and autonomy, you know, the traffic roundabout, right? Whereas traffic lights, you know, does the same thing, manages uh, traffic, but that is more control and compliance related. Lah. So, and, and, and someone mentioned, I think it was Martin who mentioned the example of um, Newton Circus in Singapore, you know, being one of the toughest uh, roundabouts to navigate or to drive. Um, and I thought, interestingly, if you have driven to Newton Circus, you, you realize it's probably a, it's a hybrid model. It's a roundabout with traffic lights. So I think that's... Uh, uniquely Singapore, uh, that we try to borrow the best of both, both uh, methodologies. The other takeaway I had was from Pohua, who mentioned that progress is not just about uh, narrowing gaps. Progress is also about opening portals of new opportunities. So I hope uh, the panel today is able to help you to uh, open up portals of new opportunities. No, so no pressure to the panelists. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, do a brief introduction of Eugenia. Eugenia, uh, as you can see, she's not from NCSS. I got to know her, again, I was just trying to jog my memory, la, that we were introduced some time back, and she herself or, or her, as, as part of a uh, Epsilon CSR program, ran a couple of uh, webinars to equip SSAs with e-marketing uh, and, and fundraising skills, uh, particularly during the height of the circuit breaker where such skills are much needed. So um, having seen how she moderate those sessions and, and MC those sessions, I thought she would be a good and very refreshing uh, face to, to help us in this panel. So Eugenia, please. Thanks, Bruce. That is such a great introduction. It'll be hard to talk. Uh, I'm Eugenia, a strategy consultant at Epsilon. We're a marketing technology company that specializes in loyalty, customer database, and campaigns management platforms. So as Bruce shared earlier, um, I had organized a few webinars with NCSS on um, how to online fundraise and better reach your donors online. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, for you guys to be hearing from the very diverse perspectives from the panelists that we have here today. Uh, and um, they will be sharing a little bit more on bringing to life what are some of the things that were shared uh, this morning. Uh, Manju, would you like to uh, do an introduction as well? Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks to NCSS for providing me this opportunity to talk on this prestigious platform. I am Manju Mohata, an occupational therapist by profession and head of assistive technology at Cerebral Policy Alliance Singapore, also known as CPAS. At CPAS, we provide services to clients with cerebral palsy and multiple disabilities under various programs. And we aim to build their functional capabilities under um, domains of living, learning, uh, vocation, and recreation. 
And assistive technology support is one of the key services we provide to uh, our beneficiaries. And uh, we believe that greatly enhanced opportunities can be generated for independent functioning of our clients or uh, uh, for by adoption of suitable technology. And in my role in assistive technology hub, I oversee its operation. And I also collaborate with internal and external stakeholders uh, for various projects of innovation and design thinking. Thank you. Manlok? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm Manlok. I'm the Deputy Managing Director for Envision Digital International. We are a global artificial intelligence of things technology company. So it's kind of a mouthful. AI, which is artificial intelligence, plus internet of things, and we coin it uh, AIoT. So we are headquartered in Singapore. Our current uh, platform is uh, also being used by the Singapore government as part of the Smart Nation Sensor Platform. And our clients in Singapore include uh, GovTech, HDB, which is Housing Development Board, uh, PSA, which is the Port of Singapore, as well as uh, Capital Corporation. So now I will hand over to SQ to introduce himself. SQ, please. Thank you, Manok. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Zichin or SQ. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, SCPI. Uh, we are a local startup uh, in the AI space. So our tagline is making AI accessible. So essentially what we do is that we work with clients, partners to help enable them to build uh, AI services or applications uh, depending on their use case and um, uh, sector specific needs. Um, so when we, when we started the company, one of the things that we want to do is so, so tech for good. So we devote some of our attention uh, resources to, um, so to see how AI, uh, technology or AI in general can be applied for the better good of uh, the humanity or society in general. Um, so very glad to be invited to be part of the panelists uh, today. Thank you. Thanks for Back a great introduction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the great introduction, panelists. Uh, and I'm sure everybody's very excited to hear about, you know, how technology is used in the social services sector uh, currently. So being the only uh, SSA in the room, Manju, uh, we will start with you. Uh, first off, how did you find today's summit? Wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> I must congratulate NCSS and the organizers and the team behind it uh, that put a lot of effort uh, to make this event a fruitful and rewarding event. Uh, it brought us new insights, but um, I, will, I will also say that um, it is um, a lot of information to digest at one time. So we, and thanks to technology, which has made it possible so that we can watch it later also at our own convenient times. So uh, that, is, uh, that, that, that was good. And I personally enjoyed the keynote presentations and the way tech show is organized. And I have yet to meet um, many tech vendors who have approached me personally on tech show. Yeah, it's a great platform. Wow, Thank it's you. nice to know that um, even with CPaaS having integrated some technology in your system already, that you are still constantly learning and looking out to how to integrate uh, and better incorporate uh, technology to better what you do. So maybe to share with uh, the audience a little bit, uh, how has CPaaS actually integrated technology to better serve your beneficiaries so far? Okay, uh, that's a very interesting question and a good question to start with. Uh, but directly going into how, I think I should start with why we adopted technology at the first place, because most of the SSAs would be able to relate to that. As I mentioned, uh, that uh, CPAS is a client-oriented service uh, provider with a vision to empower persons with special needs. And we are a public entity. We all know that. Uh, so... We all have our own uh, constraints in terms of skilled manpower and resources. So, uh, and then our uh, work is also at times very physically draining. Um, so it's very essential for organizations like us to use human capital in more resourceful ways and efficient ways so that we, can, we are able to retain our good staff and we are able to provide enhanced services and quality services to our clients. I think that can only be done by delegating repetitive, mundane, laborious, and yet simple tasks to technology. And um, 
digitization and technology adoption is just the right way uh, through which we can improve our productivity and save human energy and yet reach a um, good number of clients and serve our clients well. So that is why we adopted technology. Uh, so with this intention in mind, I think CFAS has taken several initiatives and has, has adopted a lot of technologies in these recent times. Um, and uh, maybe I will just start with uh, client facing technologies first, because there are two types, client facing and staff facing technologies. Client facing technologies are adopted with an intention to enhance their learning experience in CPAS and improve their independent, independence. Say for example, we have adopted Milo robot. Milo robot is actually used um, by uh, our allied health professionals to train clients with autism on communication, social, emotional, and behavior skills. So uh, then another technology we have adopted is Sound Eye, which we have placed in um, several places in CPAS, primarily toilets, uh, and which, which is an uh, emergency, emergency detection sensor, which enables our clients to go to toilets independently uh, without adult supervision, which was provided earlier without that sensors in place. So that has improved their independence. And of, co of course, it, uh, it has impacted their you know, sense of dignity and sense of all, you know, that because toilet is a very private place. Then another thing we have adopted for the client facing is we have created an independent living skills center, uh, which is a place for teaching our clients independent living skills. Uh, it has lots of assistive technologies, such as feeding robot and automated shower systems and smart home technologies. Uh, which is helping our clients to learn skills which were never expected from them before. Uh, I will share more examples later. I mean, I don't want to overload here in this particular answer. And then, of course, we have also adopted client and is like robots, uh, robotic uh, rehab solutions and artificial, uh, sorry, virtual reality uh, applications uh, to enhance um, uh, real context for clients when they are learning gross motor skills and fine motor skills especially uh, from physiotherapists and occupational therapists. And um, we have a lot of um, 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 like uh, use of uh, robotics and use of virtual reality games in therapies. So which enables our staff to you know, engage them more meaningfully. Yeah. Then on the other side, we have also adopted a lot of, lot of technologies for easing our staff administrative duties uh, to start with we have adopted um, e, um, e attendance, which uh, actually our attendance, our claims, our appraisals, and a lot of operational tasks have gone paperless, all digital now. So it has alleviated the need of traveling up and down and taking signatures. And our workflow systems are also in, uh, building up slowly. I mean, I, won't, I wouldn't say it has completed, but it is slowly building up. And we are no more required to go personally meet people and take signatures from for one thing or the other thing. And um, yeah, a very important thing actually I forgot to mention, we have recently, not recently, like a couple of years ago, we installed like electrical hoists and um, electrical, um, electrically height adjustable benches in uh, shower changing areas. So actually that reduced our uh, staff's effort of transferring clients from one surface to another. That was quite a laborious task for our staff. So um, I would say um, these are the things we are trying uh, to adopt and uh, uh, enhance our services with these technologies. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Manju. Actually, you 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 had a lot of uh, terminologies. Uh, you mentioned your technology, your AI, robots, Milo, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I I want to ask the smart uh, panelists, right? SQ and Manlo, since you are in this business of AI and AIOT, right? You know, having heard what uh, Manju has mentioned in terms of deployments using Milo robot and all this stuff like that, what is your take on, you know, are, are these technology that are easily accessible uh, to our SSAs or actually they are very advanced in that sense? So maybe this is Manlok, maybe I'll have a go at it first. So in terms of the robots and all this, uh, it is uh, quite readily available. If you see that uh, even the our police and uh, City Cisco, they are also rolling out these uh, police robots right, to patrol, to replace the uh, human beings. 
And I'm very, very happy to hear that uh, CPAS has already uh, gone uh, uh, very far ahead in terms of uh, digitalization, uh, in terms of workflow and procedures. But definitely uh, having the autonomous uh, vehicles, which is the robots, is one thing. But having the robots that uh, to have the algorithms to be able to think and uh, to react, uh, like the Milo uh, robots and all this, uh, that is something that uh, we have to continue to develop. Oh, yes, yes. So, uh, and all this uh, uh, robots itself uh, and autonomous guided vehicles uh, can also be onboarded to IoT platform. And that is where you can do this, uh, what we call uh, fleet view monitoring and control, as well as analytics. So SQ, you want to uh, give your take on this, please? Um, sure. Thanks, thanks, Manlo. So I think uh, for in this space, AI or technology, uh, we have come quite quite a long way. Especially in the AI field, in the last ten years, things have uh, um, developed uh, leaps and bounds. So actually, today uh, we are seeing a uh, um, more pervasive use of AI because, first of all, uh, the barrier entry has has come down quite a fair bit, uh, and the cost has also come down. So if you look at 10 years ago, you want to do a speech to text, the text to speech uh, software could be more exorbitant, but today it's fairly good and the costs are reasonable. So uh, what we're seeing uh, in general is that um, um, all the tech companies uh, in the industry itself, um, things have developed, costs have come down. That's why it's making it more affordable for either SSAs for, or even the individuals. So I just want to add also that a lot of um, this development actually came from the consumer world. So because in a, there's a lot of development in the consumer tech itself, um, it makes uh, technology more pervasive and actually drives the cost down. So I think today we are reaping the benefits of this one. Um, question is obviously, how do you adapt all this technology to specific SSA use cases? Um, I would like to emphasize that you know um, technology is one part of it, an enabler, but actually more important is also understanding the use case and the workflow. Um, because if no amount of tech can solve a workflow problem, uh, if you're not sure. So um, usually, in, even in my experience dealing with a lot of uh, clients or partners, uh, we tend to focus a bit more on the, on, on, on the use case itself and, and how it can be, technology can be integrated or it, maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe it's a, it may be purely a workflow problem. We just adapt it, uh, it, it's good enough. So these are the things uh, uh, I think um, moving forward for SSAs, I think uh, uh, something to, to be mindful of. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. So it sounds like actually a lot of the technology that sounds very newfangled to us has been in the market for very long. Just maybe um, in terms of the way it is applied, it's a little bit different and more specific uh, to this, uh, to your to your particular use case. Uh, for example, uh, speech to text, as well as the hoisting system. So I have a follow-up question uh, also for Ms. Uh, Manju, right? So you shared with us a huge range of projects that CPAS has uh, implemented, right? Mm -hmm. From being uh, service-centric and being you know, customer-centric uh, to the administrative end of it, to managing manpower. So that sounds like a whole bunch of work. How did you get started into implementing these technology and uh, how is the process like? Okay, um, actually we have to start early. We have to start early. We have to start analyzing our needs early. So the easy, easiest process is we have to analyze what we do on a regular basis, which is very repetitive. I think since uh, SIPA started this process very early, then we started looking for the solutions which are available in the market, or we might also have, but we have not utilized it to the extent which is possible. Say, for example, uh, Microsoft 365, we already have it. Uh, we have already paid for it. But then there are so many workflow processes available in that itself, which we could utilize, and we have utilized, started utilizing it, so that our workflow processes are seamless. Uh, so that way, we have to an start analyzing the things early and uh, noting down our tasks which are very repetitive and very mundane for our staff to perform. Then after that, looking for the right solutions in the market and matching it, matching, of, uh, the, matching the solution to our need is crucial. And having the right attitude, having the openness and managing uh, staff apprehension, all those things uh, need to be taken care of. 
because sometimes our staff can be apprehensive of adopting technologies and um, uh, having uh, that strategic plan in place, digital strategic plan in place. So all these are the steps uh, to start thinking about technology adoption. And then of course, sourcing for the funds is a very important task. And I, I want to thank NCSS here um, because they have provided, provided us lots of opportunities and lots of funds. In fact, the consultation they have provided uh, for um, technical uh, consultancy is also very useful for us because sometimes as SSAs, we are service providers. We might not know what is out in the market, but NCSS has brought that technology to our doorsteps in um, arranged like tech shows and arranged um, uh, like um, meetings with consultants. So I think these are the early steps we have to take and we have to take the ownership uh, to start this process. NCSS is giving us platform, but then at the at, at our side, we have to be proactive and we have to look for the solutions ourselves also. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Manju for crediting NCSS. Uh, <laughs> but I, I thought it's, it's good to chime in uh, for me from NCSS perspective. Uh, and I, yeah. I, I kind of echo SQ's point, right? That technology may not be the solution. You know, sometimes you look at it, you know, we look at the processes and all that. So I think the starting point of why we are implementing, you know, or, or what problem we are solving, you know, it's just as important how we are solving it. And in the end, you know, technology may or may not be uh, the right panacea to all the issues yeah. that we have. La. So, yeah. Thanks. So, Manju, you also mentioned that, you know, at the start, uh, maybe needs analysis is something that uh, we can start with for that. So, what are some of the areas that you feel, uh, like, how can someone start at kickstarting the needs analysis process? Um, within the organization and change from within? Okay, uh, if I speak about uh, CPAS perspective, right? What we started with is uh, we have to uh, categorize our tasks in operational and client-facing tasks. So from there only, we will be able to build up what, it, what needs to be delegated to technology. Say for example, in the areas of operation, we know that our staff of 250, I don't know, 250 or 300 staff have to uh, um, you know, sign attendance every day and log out every day. That is paper-based. There are lots of purchase requisitions being filled up every day and lots of processes internally uh, which require signatures from different parties. Then there is, any time a new staff comes in, has to go for induction to different departments and different departments have to pay 30 minutes to introduce staff, new staff, uh, to the services we offer. So that is like very repetitive work and it is happening every 15 days. And sometimes like attendance and claims is happening every day. So these are very repetitive tasks and is solutions, technological solutions are readily available in the market. It's just that um, matter of your intention and awareness and will to adopt it. And of course, funding is important. I, I don't think I should be talking a lot about funding here because that is not our uh, you know, main um, goal here to talk about our crisis and all those things. But what I'm saying is, if we identify that these are the things which are going every day, or every month, every 15 days, we can actually digitalize those things. Uh, another area is our, our staff take notes for clients, you know, taking documentations and ma maintaining clients related notes. That is also, that was used to be on paper a few years ago, but everything has gone digital. So it becomes very easy for our staff uh, to work from anywhere in the CPAS premises, they don't need to be at their desks always and um, holding paper and pen in their hands. Uh, so this is like staff related tasks. And when we start with the client facing task, we have to analyze what is really laborious, what is very effortful and what we can, uh, what technology we can bring in, which enhances our client's experience. Like I mentioned, uh, smart home. So a few years ago, because our, uh, our CPAS clients are physically immobile and they're always sitting in their wheelchairs, nobody expected from them that they will answer the doorbells. Nobody expected from them that they will be able to clean their house and uh, they will be able to cook food for them. But with the advent of smart home technologies, which we have adopted recently, we are hoping that we will be able to train them to answer doorbells, to control their immediate environment, to clean their Im immediate environment. So these are the things, if we start analyzing that what our uh, clients potential have and where they can reach, I think we will be able to think about re relevant technologies. 
because technologies are there in the market already. Yeah. Th thanks, Manju. Uh, yeah. I, 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 then again, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Virginia. Really is, is because you say, yes, the technology is there and all that. But I, I understand sometimes, you know, maybe um, either staff or the board or a management, right, may not uh, grasp the full extent of technology, particularly new technology, right, like AI and IoT and all that. So maybe again, posting this question to SQ or Manlock, right? You know, you're in a position as, as a service provider or a solution provider. How would you convince, you know, imagine the management or the board uh, to adopt something that they may not have a full grasp on, you know, what is AI, what will AI do for me? And as opposed to, for example, a HR management system that has been well articulated, right? The benefits and, you know, uh, of, of HR or accounting system are, are well articulated. Whereas an area of new tech, you know, be it AI or, or something else, it's, it's uh, less fathomable, you know, in that sense. What, what, what would you do or say to convince the board of management that this is something they should invest in? Um, maybe I'll start first. I'll take a step on this one. Um, so, so you're right. Actually, uh, I think Manju also mentioned, um, we cannot assume that everyone is tech savvy. So obviously no. Um, in fact, at the management, even at the working level, a lot of people, at least in my interaction, I mean, can feel intimidated because today we are kind of like overwhelmed <laughs> Um, by all this uh, uh, technology jargons, AI, deep learning, all these things, um, it is kind of, kind of uh, overwhelming. Um, so, but the most important thing is to get buy-in not only from the top, uh, obviously the stakeholders, but also buy-in from, let's say, um, the, the ranks and files. So they need to be comfortable to, to, to realize the potential of this, uh, uh, technologies. So at a, maybe at a senior management level, one way is to only conduct workshop just to paint out, um, not so much on selling, but you know, to 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 share, you know, um, based on uh, uh, the landscapes, what technology can help with. Um, now, like I've mentioned before, I'm I'm very particular about you know. Sometimes uh, it's not a technology looking for a problem to solve. It's more like you have a problem whether this will fit. Now it may not be a fit. It may not be a fit, or it may not be a fit now. It could be a fit uh, maybe a few months or few years down the road. So um, a lot of it's about awareness and. I mean, also sad to say that, you know, um, I mean, the media sometimes sensationalize things. Um, so it makes people like, oh, okay, I need to know the latest stuff. Or, you know, okay, my job's, uh, my job's on the knife, you know, maybe it's gone tomorrow. So, so um, I, I think first, first and foremost, whether is it at the, at the stakeholder levels or even the ranks of files is actually to have a better understanding, or appreciation of what technology can do and what it cannot do. There are limitations. Um, and, you know, how can be applied to it? Um, we always talk about, you know, AI, you know, um, maybe taking over the world, um, you know, all this, uh, 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 you know, doomsday scenario. But the reality, the reality is actually humans are still very much in control. Only the users, only the true users, the SSAs, the, the staff itself, they have a use case, they have problems that needs to be solved. And it's for us, let's say solution provider, or vendors like uh, like us to, to figure out whether whether is it, can we can we apply it may may not may so um, I think uh, the first step is honestly is a, a bit of uh, educational work on that. Yep, and I echo SQ. So uh, no, most of the time when we speak to the board or the top management of any companies, a lot of times they they do not know what uh, AI is all about. So uh, we have to illustrate uh, with use case and. Uh, for all we know, actually, uh, AI is so prevalent today. Eh? Uh, take, for example, uh, this uh, weather forecast. In the weather forecasting itself, uh, there's so much uh, machine learning. There's so many algorithms uh, that is actually able to, with our weather forecasting team in Singapore, we have actually granularized uh, the weather forecast using AI to make it uh, into 100 meters by 100 meters resolution. So it is being used today without us even knowing it. Eh? So what's important is, uh, is what SQ say, besides the, the top management, the rank and file, uh, I think a lot of questions we need to also address is that how do we increase productivity, reduce costs, and uh, also keep jobs, right? Uh, keeping jobs is mainly keeping jobs uh, for the uh, Singapore-based people. 
Uh, a lot of jobs that are labor, labor intensive, uh, that is something that uh, we cannot afford to keep, unfortunately. So then again, uh, this AI will actually uh, help in that process. Eh? So these are things that uh, with the use case, uh, we can sit down with the, with the uh, board and also the management team and we can work it through. Thank you. So in talking about AI, both SQ and Manlock, both of you uh, have brought up the concept of use cases, how we can apply it with the technology that you have, right? So I would like to ask you this question whereby within the social services sector, after hearing uh, the challenges that are being faced by the SSAs, how do you think or what are some of the use cases could there be for um, AI and AIoT? Yeah. So let me go for this first. Uh, so in terms of uh, AIoT, uh, of course, uh, SSAs, uh, you may be facing, uh, as what I heard, uh, some resource constraints, right, with regards to human resources. So this type of resources, uh, now with uh, IoT as a platform, basically you can actually put on wearables uh, with GPS coordinates, as well as uh, leveraging on the CCTV for the video analytics. Everything can be onboarded to IoT platform. And from there, they will be able to do the uh, analysis, big data analysis. For example, COVID. Eh? COVID contact tracing is something that uh, built by GovTech, the token as well as the safe entry that's built by GovTech. And we're all using it. It's onboarded to the IoT platform. So whenever there's a COVID case, eh, they will just use the big data analytics to call up, to call up who is next to this COVID patient uh, during this period of time. And from there, they will then uh, be able to identify it. So these are things that uh, the technology can definitely help and creating a machine to machine social network. Eh? So a lot of times uh, we talk about machine to, what, what does it mean, right? Imagine you go to the airport today. Uh, the airport has so many CCTVs, every corner I'm sure is being monitored, but we still have an app to say that there's a coffee spill, you take a picture, you WhatsApp to this particular number and then somebody will come and clean it, right? So the question is that uh, why can't the CCTV with the coordinates go to the IoT platform and ask the cleaning robot to go there and do it? So it re really reduces the human interference and that is the thing that I think the SSAs uh, can also adopt uh, to also uh, make sure that the people is focused on uh, things that is uh, for the beneficiaries, uh, improving the service for beneficiaries, uh, giving the, uh, the uh, good uh, uh, reports of how the donors are using, uh, spending the money of the donors and all this, so and stakeholder management. So that is the things that SSA need to focus on and not about cleaning or watching over the beneficiaries because that should be done by the AI and the IoT platform. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll just add on a little. I mean, Manu has spoken pretty much. And um, just now, actually, Manju also highlighted a few things, and, and that is very relevant. Uh, first of all, um, um, I mean, the whole idea about, you know, technology, whether it's AI or uh, digital technology in general, can be applied to two, two different ways, two aspects. One is directly benefiting the, um, the person with disability or special needs or the patient's. So this like your uh, speech attacks, your eyeball tracking, this is a technologies that have become more pervasive actually because benefited obviously from the rise of the consumer tech. So this is one aspect. Now, um, technology can also be used in helping staff. So I think Andrew mentioned about all the things to, to improve productivity, improve operational efficiencies. So uh, um, the use case, I think Manu had mentioned, you know, uh, uh, in a way, maybe may, may using computer vision. Um, instead of, let's say, having caretakers, uh, caregivers looking uh, out for all the patients, you know, maybe using a system um, to, to help you monitor abnormal behavior. And then you alert someone to take response. First of all, this thing, in theory, um, a bit more repetitive, mundane. So leave it to the machine. So the idea is find use cases whereby uh, it's repetitive, you know, and it defocuses from your core work and see whether, you know, AI or uh, technology can be applied to that. Uh, obviously, it must also make commercial sense, economic sense. Uh, if it's going to be very costly, then maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, so these this are the things uh, from, let's say, a, a adoption point of view, uh, we will have to take into considerations as well. So from both you, uh, SQ and Manlock have mentioned about, you know, reducing, using technology to reduce repetitive and mundane tasks. So Manju, from your experience in CPAS, uh, have you seen that adoption of this technology has actually improved uh, maybe staff satisfaction or staff morale in any way? 
Yes, yes, definitely. As I mentioned, like uh, there are few things which are very um, effort taking for staff, like shifting clients from one surface to another. So specifically, those technologies when we adopted, uh, staff was very happy, and they had they had a very good satisfaction. They actually gave a very good feedback about the technology, specifically for hoists and for shower changing benches, which are height adjustable. And of course, if it reduces their time and effort to travel up and down and operational duties, uh, that is also helping them. And then they know that they are able to focus more on clients and they are not engaged in those tasks which are really not meaningful for them. So yes, definitely it has really improved uh, our staff's morale. And we do um, follow up after uh, every implementation phase, uh, which is done um, usually like maybe three months or four months later. And we always take a constant feedback from our staff, how it is going and do they, if they need any help in uh, upskilling or learning the technology. We usually create videos whenever the vendor is coming to train our staff to uh, use that technology. And those videos are always part for uh, later use whenever they are forgetting about how to use and all those things. So we are utilizing like cloud services um, quite often, yeah. Mm. So training is an integral part uh, of implementing a new technology. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. And yeah. I have a question from Pigeonhole uh, that is kind of related to this as well, where mm. um, they mentioned that you know organizations might roll out digital tools for the clients as well. Um, how do we solve for situations where the clients are not tech savvy uh, or are not willing to embrace digitalization? Um, I think buddy system works everywhere. If you mm. can provide them buddies who are tech savvy, who are more inclined to the purpose and who are more uh, willing to uh, adopt it, they can be influenced. And uh, knowing, telling them or showing them the use cases or the, uh, the success of those who have adopted the technology. I think uh, success stories are very important to highlight every now and then. So in our CPAS, actually, we try to adopt that so if a client is able to do achieve something with the use of any technology, we highlight that so that others are motivated to do that also. So um, that helps. So buddy system is important of attaching any less tech CV with a high tech CV person. It can be in staff. It can be in a client also. It can apply to client also. And uh, definitely we have to motivate them and sh keep sharing the uh, good story and success stories of the technology use. Yeah. Mm. I, I have so, a question. I know CPATS is certainly not one of the SSAs um, I'm going to talk about, but really, you know, sometimes when I try to get SSAs to adopt particularly new technology, right, they have uh, like a, you know, wait and see um, attitude, you know, say, why don't we wait for the cost to come down? Why don't we wait for more success stories? Why don't we wait for this or wait for that? I'm not sure whether the panelists have any answer to that. You know, what a, are there any opportunity costs when it comes to waiting? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe I have a, an answer for this. Uh, we have experienced this in our assistive technology. Um, whenever, a techno whenever, whenever there's a new technology in the market, it is always very highly priced. Uh, to give you an example, we adopted iGIS technologies for training our clients on communication skills. When it all started, it was like 20K or 25K around that price but now it is like 9K or 8K. So there will always be economy of scale. When people start using the technology, it will always go down. We just need to strike a right balance when we want it. We should not be overwhelmed with the technology. We just purchase a white elephant and then we are not using it. So if we have analyzed our needs uh, to the extent, then we are very sure that this technology we need, I think we still can go ahead with a pricey element. But if we don't, think and we are not convinced within ourselves that this technology may help us, uh, then we should wait. Yeah, so yeah, that's my take, that's my personal take. So I always analyze the benefits and the cost. And if benefits are really high, then I can let go of the cost factor. Thank you. Okay. So I think we have about five minutes left. Uh, so we'd like to kick off uh, the last but definitely not least question uh, where partnerships is such a big theme that is mentioned uh, in today's um, 
keynotes as well as in today's uh, speeches by Ms. Anita Pham as well as uh, Minister Masagos. So uh, first off, maybe we'll start off with SU and Manlock. Uh, hearing some of the challenges faced by SSAs in their digital transformation journeys, how do you think that the private, public, people, and non-profit sector can work cohesively and partner to improve service delivery? Uh, and what is one thing you think you can do in your power to help the sector transform and make the transformative leap to becoming a smart SSA? Uh, so in terms of uh, from uh, at least my view is that uh, uh, everybody, include, especially technology companies today, uh, we always go for ecosystem partnerships. And likewise uh, for the SSAs uh, to also, uh, and uh, already uh, Bruce and yourselves has already talked about this at NCSS together with SSA, you are already creating this ecosystem of partners. So that is very important. You should widen it uh, to also bring in some technology providers like ourselves. And of course, from the technology provider viewpoint, we will uh, uh, hold workshops. We're happy to hold workshops to share with them uh, some of the, uh, the uh, uh, latest uh, in terms of uh, developments of technology and also to remove this misconception that uh, AI is going to be expensive uh, because AI today is being so prevalent uh, that uh, you know, as what SQ was saying, it's already applied to consumer and it's now containerized. So meaning to say it can actually apply to any other uh, uh, SSAs even for that matter at minimal cost. And just now to Manju's point that uh, new technologies uh, tend to be more expensive, yes. But uh, also if you have a need and you go to a particular uh, provider and you say that I have this need and typically for something that uh, the new technology providers want to make it into a product, you'll be amazed at the kind of pricing that it will come after. Yeah, it can be very, very uh, cost effective. Yeah. So SQ, SSC, you want yeah. to speak to that? Yeah, so um, I, I think uh, today's launch, I think uh, one big part is about this uh, process of partners. I think that's that's the right start. Maybe traditionally, as I understand, you know, um, in, in the social sectors, it's typically a government and you know uh, non profit. Now, um, and we probably need to uh, engage the, the, the private companies as well as technology partners like us. And um, the way I see it, you know, um, you know, these days CSR is a big thing. Corporate social responsibility, both from an individual point of view as well as a corporate point of view. So there, there. Um, it's just that uh, we need probably a way to connect um, to, to the different, let's say, needs uh, between the organization and the state. So a uh, building this system will, will definitely help. Uh, it's a good start. Maybe start something small first. Uh, work with a few partners, try it out uh, this model. Uh, this is partnership models because um, um, there will be something that uh, organization or individual level can volunteer on a pro bono basis. Uh, there will also be maybe a cost plus basis. So um, I, I guess have to test it out. Uh, the different models, see which one will, 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 will work out in the long run. Um, from, from, let's say, from our point of view, I mentioned earlier that uh, when we started the company, one of the things we do is uh, tech for good. So we, we are happy to work with uh, uh, non or social enterprises to look into see how technology can be used for another good. Um, that means that we basically we can conduct um, workshops. Um, I don't know. Know, is that um, to share some experience or what are the pros and cons of technology. Um, and I always like to bring it to the point um, about uh, how to make technology more accessible. I, all my company is making AI more accessible. So making it accessible means um, so that everyone feels that it's something, a tool that they can use, not, use, not be like intimidated or not overwhelmed by it. So I think that's a minimum that we can start uh, um, um, as, as, as a organization or as a company that uh, wants to contribute back to the community. Okay, thanks, thanks, SQ. Okay, I also share uh, what I'll do in my powers, right? I will hold Manlong and SQ to their word, lah. Get Manlong to do more road shows, you know, and then get SQ to join us in the design of uh, technology and all that. And of course, Manju as well. You're not getting away. Share more success stories from PIPAS to the rest of the yes. sector. Yes, and okay. we don't have to work in silos. We can yes. always work collaboratively. Yeah, we we need to share our needs. Yeah, so I think the time's up. Uh, I will hand it, uh, thanks Eugenia, I'll hand it back to Jaisal. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you panel for the very engaging discussion. I'm sure all of you gained as much insights as I did. 
We appreciate questions from everyone and apologize if, if we did not manage to answer all due to time constraints. Before we close this segment, we'd like to invite the panel to take a group photo with us. Maybe invite them to smile at the screen for a few seconds, please. Kindly hold your smile as we take the photos. One, two, three. Okay, we will just take one more. One, two, three. Smile. All right, okay. Thank you. Um, before we end this whole segment, I would like to invite you, all of you to take a quick poll using um, the pigeon hold. We will see a panel discussion feedback. Um, do click the button and just take about less than a minute to answer um, the three simple questions. Okay, as you are doing uh, the feedback, we have now come to the end of the segment. So for delegates who have registered to attend AGM, please go to Jubilee Agenda page, select AGM and sign in with your SingPass. For assistance, please call the hotlines indicator on the screen. For those who are not joining the ADM, uh, AGM, I would highly recommend you to take some time to join the tech showcase from Jubilee Explore page and discover for yourself more than 50 technologies that can optimize operations and improve productivity and also enable smart social services. The tech showcase will run on Jubilee till 13 August to allow participants to view product demos at your own time and set up appointments with exhibitors to explore their products and, uh, or services and collaborate. Last but not least, we also appreciate if you could take five minutes of your time to fill up this submit survey by scanning the QR code or using the link in the chat function. So thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. <laughs>The main help that we provide these children are learning support for children in primary schools from P1 to P6. Before uh, the circuit breaker was announced, we had stopped all classes in our centre for one week to make preparations for our online classes. Within Care Corner, we had a strong support from another team, Volunteer and Community Engagement. They went to source for laptops for our children and we received donated laptops from UOB, from uh, anonymous donors. When we presented these laptops to the parents, they were really, really very grateful and appreciative that uh, we are able to help them in this aspect. We try to get the seniors to share their recipes so we get the seniors from their own culture to come and share their particular cuisine. A lot of um, in-house programs, we can't do it, as well as the outing, which the senior likes a lot. But because of CV, we can't bring them out. So we are trying to go online. I will try to do one on my own. So at least they are able to go to the Facebook and see how it's being run so that they don't feel so nervous when it's their turn. We try to bring back centres activities virtually into their homes. I think they really enjoy because they see familiar faces of our staff, taking effort to try to engage them via YouTube and Facebook Live. So I would tell others to be more open-minded 
and also look out for the silver lining in every difficult situation. Technology has a lot of advantages. Of course, it has its challenges as well, but we see a lot of the benefits that it can bring to the senior. You need a lot of patience and you need to give them a lot of positive encouragement. Just coming together as a team to brainstorm what are the innovative ways that we can actually reach out and engage our elders. I think it just starts with an idea. You know, no idea is too crazy. Lah. Dream big, start small and stay strong. <laughs>
to actually look for learning, volunteering and even positive ageing opportunities. Through this initiative, uh, Council for Third Age managed to convert a segment of seniors who were initially hesitant to adopt new technology. At the same time, we were able to reach out to a new segment of seniors who are more digitally savvy. They are now more ready to try other technology like uh, online messaging, Zoom, Google Meet and all this will actually bring a positive change in their daily lives. During the circuit breaker, we changed the model of distribution. The virtual food.
A very good afternoon to all. Welcome to the NCSS Annual General Meeting 2021. I'm Sheena and I'll be bringing you through this afternoon's programme. To kick things off, I would like to invite you to enjoy a video on NCSS's achievements in the past financial year. Suddenly, COVID-19 struck our shores and we found ourselves in a crisis of a generation. It was a challenging time for our nation and people. During COVID-19, the whole social service sector have been working very hard, doubly hard, to make sure that everyone gets what they need. Here's your story, let's begin. The world is fine, come on, dive in. The future's here, it's right before your eyes. Step by step, you're on your way. You're welcome to a brighter day. Don't you know it feels good to be alive? You could be alive. You know you could. Yeah, the times are changing everywhere. Do we dream and do we dare? It's up to you. The door is open wide. Feel the rhythm of today. Learn the part and join the play. The world is here. Let's take it for a ride. Hey, you could be larger than life.
know you could to invite Miss Tan Lee San, Chief Executive Officer, um, to give the opening address. A very good afternoon, Ms. Anita Pham, President of NCSS, NCSS board members, council members, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us at the NCSS Annual General Meeting 2021. For those of you who were at the Social Service Summit this morning, I hope that you were inspired and energized by all the inspiring speeches that we heard uh, from our panelists, from our speakers. I'm also told that there were lively discussions at the breakout sessions, so I'm very happy to hear that. The video you just saw highlights NCSS key achievements in the past year. It was certainly a busy year, to say the least. Let me now take a few minutes to share with you some of our initiatives in the year ahead. For those of you who heard my sharing at the summit this morning, I'm afraid this will sound quite familiar. In 2021, our work will continue to be guided by the strategic thrusts of the 4ST, even as we work with all of you to refresh the 4ST roadmap. We will focus on driving empowerment, moving from a program-centric to a person-centric mindset, as Anita spoke about at the summit this morning. Building, we will build strong social purpose entities focusing on organizational development, digitalization, board leadership, among others, and develop an impactful social service sector with a key shift from fundraising to a philanthropic mindset. Aligned with the first 4ST thrust, NCSS will continue to empower service users in line with our three service priorities. So helping families who find themselves in a cycle of social disadvantage break out of it, uplifting persons with mental health conditions to achieve empowerment and social inclusion, supporting caregivers to manage their caregiving responsibilities and care for themselves as well. Key to uplifting these communities is to empower them so that they can have a voice and play a part in improving their own lives. We understand the challenges you face in operationalizing the principles of empowerment and have therefore launched the Empowerment Guide earlier today. We hope that the practical steps and tools in the guide will be useful in your empowerment journey. On our part, we will work with you to implement this and also consider how we might refine our own funding models to encourage empowerment. We also hope to drive greater collaboration and collective impact in the sector. The SG Together Alliance for Action reflects this principle of collaboration and bringing in di diverse perspectives from different stakeholders. Together with SG Enable, we have formed an AFA for caregivers of persons with disability and will be working with community partners to tackle issues around support and care for these caregivers. In line with the second thrust of the 4ST, we will continue to build strong social purpose entities through capacity and capability building. The Community Capability Trust was designed to support capability and capacity building of SSAs. We want to take an integrated approach using service priorities as one lens to identify the capabilities that the sector and individual SSAs need to develop most urgently. The past year showed us how critical technology and digitalization are for SSAs. Launched at the summit earlier, the Industry Digital Plan for Social Services, or IDPSS, will complement existing digitalization efforts by providing a roadmap for SSAs on technology solutions that you can adopt, depending on your level of digital maturity and the subsector that you are in. The IDPSS will also point you to funding and resources that are available and sector-wide shared platforms that you can connect to. Strengthening board leadership will be a key focus for NCSS in the coming year. Through a collaborative effort with other uh, agencies, including uh, CNPL, uh, Singapore Institute of Directors, and the Charity Council, NCSS will work on enhancing capabilities of board leaders, make available board diagnostic tools, build a pipeline of potential board members with diverse capabilities, and also increase engagement and networking opportunities to build an ecosystem of support among board leaders. As part of the third 4ST thrust, we need to rally the community to create an impactful social service ecosystem. We hope to promote more strategic partnerships among SSAs, corporates, and other partners as we shift from a fundraising to a philanthropic mindset. The community chest will continue to rally the community 
and expand its efforts through new and innovative streams of donations. For example, the Change for Charity initiatives hopes to encourage consumption-based giving and also provide an opportunity for businesses to weave giving into their business models. Volunteers have always been a force multiplier in our sector, and they play a hugely important role in augmenting SSA manpower. To complement the many volunteer management resources that NCSS rolled out last year, we will also be developing a learning and development roadmap for VM practitioners. The roadmap sets out skills development pathways so that VM practitioners can identify the competencies they need and plan their own career in the sector. NCSS will also be unveiling our sector evaluation framework to provide a common language to describe, measure, and report impact. There will be two levels to this framework, at the program level, where you can tap on a metrics bank of outcome indicators that are most relevant for your programs, and a sector level layer, using quality of life metrics as a base. Using a QOL perspective forces us to take a person-centric approach to evaluation, and also allows us to track service user outcomes over time. Now, we spoke a lot about transformation of the sector and our vision for the sector today. At NCSS, we are also ourselves undergoing an internal transformation. We hope to transform the way we work through more agile and digital processes, uplift our own workforce, and also transform our workplace. As part of our transformation journey, we plan to adopt more digitalization to provide a seamless user experience for all our stakeholders. For example, we launched the Sunray portal recently, a mobile-friendly one-stop portal that allows Sunrays to access all essential services anytime, anywhere. We also launched an AI chatbot called Ray for real-time interaction with Sunray applicants. Besides helping us to process these applications more effectively, using these technologies will also allow for better data analysis of trends and also allow us to better refine our strategies over time. We are also working on more seamless grants portal in collaboration with other funding agencies to make applying for grants and reporting on outcomes a hopefully more pleasant experience. Moving ahead, NCSS will also be enhancing our social service navigator so that it becomes an integrated service, delivery, uh, integrated service directory for the public on social services that are available. So thank you all for the support towards NCSS and the work that we do. I look forward very much to working with all of you towards our vision of empowering every person to live with dignity in a caring and inclusive society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tan. For the AGM, all official representatives will be able to vote. Non-official representatives will only see the live streaming view without the voting functions. We are using Thundercoat's virtual platform for today's voting proceedings. Now, let us go through a short presentation on how to navigate the voting process. To begin, Official representatives will need your sync pass to log in to Thundercode's Secure Meet platform in order to vote. To log in, you may scan a QR code on screen using the sync pass app, or you may click on the alternate login tab and log in by entering your NRIC and phone number. You will then receive a one-time code via SMS. Once you're re successfully registered, you'll be able to see the resolutions items when it is time to vote. Once you have selected your vote preference, click Submit, and you will be automatically redirected back to the main resolutions page to vote for the next resolution. All three resolutions are open for voting concurrently. If you have any questions regarding NCSS audited financial statements, an annual report for the financial year ended 31st of March 2021, please click Join on this item, enter your questions, and click Submit. There is also a vote function for you to indicate the questions that you have the same sentiments for. Votes for each question is visible, and we will attempt to address the most voted questions first. 
Similarly, we will also attempt to address the most voted questions first during the dialogue with members segment. Finally, if you require any technical assistance, you can contact the numbers you see on screen or email us at the email address provided. We will attempt to help you troubleshoot the issue remotely. I would now like to introduce our key office barriers on the AGM panel. First, Ms. Anita Pham, President, NCSS. Mr. Philip Tan, Chairman, Community Chest. Mr. Latif bin Ibrahim, Honorary General Secretary. Ms. Tan Keo Ngo, Honorary Treasurer. And Ms. Tan Lee San, Chief Executive Officer of NCSS. I will now hand over the time to Mr. Latif, Honorary General Secretary of NCSS, to commence the AGM proceedings. Mr. Latif, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here with us today. I know it has been a long day for many of us, and we at NCSS are appreciative of your presence at this AGM. My name is Latif Ibrahim, NCSS Honorary General Secretary. I would like to first and foremost wish that next year I will be able to see all of you in person. That's my wish for this AGM. At this moment, we do not have sufficient official representatives from the full council members to meet the quorum needed for the meeting. In accordance with Regulation 6.4 of NCSS meeting regulations, we will wait 30 minutes into the AGM appointed time of 3 p.m. for all full council members present to form the quorum. From now till the appointed time of 3.30 p.m., let us take a look at some videos that have been prepared for you. Thank you very much. You're listening to the Lunchtime Express. As we enter our fifth week of Circuit Breaker, we hope you and your family are keeping safe and well at home.哦，这么僵硬啊！你修那个装作什么？拜托你了，你以为你的公司很有礼貌？你不要他了，家里还有白吹吗？走了，先吃饭了。哎，先吃饭了。你来啦你现在没有交工我刚好开车到附近顺便买一些水果给你哦进来进来哦我不进来了那那你这个水果你做出啊还有这是这个月的家用不用了啊拿啦哎呀拿去买东西不用我叫你收你就收了我自己用
又把这些搬回来，都已经坏了，你修了也没有用。He's getting better now. He's more calm. Okay. I can see my dad smiling a bit more now, so I think he's getting better. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Ong and Jay. I'll see you again next week. Um, as usual, I would like to speak to Mr. Ong now. Okay. All right. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Mr. Ong, I know the journey is not an easy one, but I'm glad that you seek help early. And I can also see that you are coping better now. Maybe you can share with me how you're feeling? I feel better. Some days are easier. Some days, not so much. But it's okay. I feel I'm more open to talk. And I know I have support. And I'm more in control. This is Natalie, our new volunteer manager. I'm bringing her around today to meet all of the seniors. Hello! Can we get volunteers in to engage these seniors? Yes, let's do that. Hi, good afternoon. I'm looking to find some volunteers to run activities for seniors. Do you think you could help rally some volunteers together? Hello? Oh, no worries. Um, it's okay. Thanks for letting us know. Next time, maybe? One more time. Go for it. Hi, darling. Mom, are you coming home soon? Yes, mommy's coming home already. See you soon, okay? Bye bye.
Sure, we'll be happy to rally our volunteers. Thank you so much. This means so much to our seniors. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, see you. Bye-bye. Yes. You represented Singapore? Well, that's 40 years ago. Of all the medals and trophies I have, this one means the most to me. The volunteers are appreciated today. This is for you. What's MVP? Once again, a gentle reminder that official representatives will need to log in using your SingPass in order to vote. I will now hand over the time to Mr. Latif. I hope you have enjoyed the videos. We have now waited 30 minutes into the AGM appointed time of 3 p.m. In accordance to Regulation 6.4 of the NCSS meeting regulations, I announce that all full council members present will now form the quorum for this AGM. On behalf of the president of NCSS, who is presiding over this AGM, I will now call the meeting to order. We will now proceed with the passing of the three standard resolutions. The first item on the agenda is resolution number one to confirm the minutes of NCSS AGM 2020 that was held on 15 July 2020. These minutes had been sent to all members together with the first notice of AGM on 10th May 2021. No amendments were received by 14 June 2021. I will therefore now request the official representatives to vote on resolution number one to confirm these minutes. For the avoidance of doubt, the voting of this resolution will remain open through to the next two agenda items, but your timely voting would be appreciated. Thank you. The second item on the agenda is resolution number two, to receive and adopt 
the FY 2020 NCSS audited financial statements and the auditor's report thereon for the year ended 31st March 2021. These statements were incorporated into the annual report that was circulated to all members on 2nd July 2021. I will now invite Ms. Justin Chu, NCSS Finance Director, to give a short presentation on these financial statements. Justin, please, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let, let, let me now bring you through the financial statements for NCSS for financial and year ended 31st March 2021. Next slide, please. Overall, on the whole, NCSS has turned in a surplus of 24.85 million in FY20 due to a better than expected gain from investment returns. As compared to FY19, of a surplus of 6.28 million, we see a net increase of 18.57 million. Please note that FY20 refers to year 2021 in, your, in the financial statement, whereas FY19 refers to year 2020. Next slide, please. On the community chairs uh, front, Community shares has raised a total of 87.35 million in FY20 as compared to 58.66 million in FY19 with a growth of 28.69 million. At the same time, allocation to SSA has increased from 59.14 million in FY19 to 71.65 million in FY20 to better support our members to cope with the impact of COVID-19. On the whole, the surplus for FY20 stands at 15.7 million, out of which 15.37 million is reinvested for the courage fund, and only 0.33 million is available for general use. Next slide, please. Next, we move on to the various groups within NCSS to see how we have performed in FY20. Corporate departments have turned in a surplus of 25.08 million due to higher investment income, government grants, and external funding for increased project activity. As compared to FY19's surplus of 5.86 million, we see a net increase of 19.22 million. Next slide, please. Similar to previous year, Comchess has generated a balanced budget. Due to higher funding support from tote board, given the higher donation raise, and at the same time, lower fundraising expenses. Next slide, please. For FY20, SSI has generated a small deficit of 0 0.23 million due to, higher, due to lower grant and lower cost fees with the, despite the lower operating expenses. Next slide, please. Taking into account NCSS overall performance, our general fund would then increase from 39.7 million in FY19 to 64.55 million in FY20 due to the operating surplus. For Comchess fund, it will increase from 74.43 million in FY19 to 90.13 million in FY20, out of which 15.37 million is reinvested for the courage fund, and 30 million will be set aside for community capability. D trust CCT in short. Next slide, please. I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, should any of you have any questions relating to the financial statements, please submit the questions through the function on your right, titled Questions on Financial Statements and Annual Report. If you concur with a similar question that has already been posted, you may click on the upvote button. For all other questions, my request, for all other questions not relating to the financial statements or annual, or annual report, I request that you reserve your questions until the dialogue segment.
It's all right. <coughs> if there are no further questions, I will now request the official representatives to vote on resolution number two to receive and adopt the FY 2020 NCSS audited financial statements for the year ended 31st March 2021. Similarly, for the avoidance of doubt, the voting for this resolution will remain open through the, to the next agenda item. But again, your timely voting will be much appreciated. Thank you. I come now to the third item on the agenda, which is resolution number three, to receive and adopt the annual report that was circulated to all members on 2nd July 2021. Should any of you have any questions relating to the annual report, please submit the questions or vote through the function questions on financial statements and annual report. For all other questions not relating to the financial statements or annual report, please reserve your questions until the dialogue segment. Thank you. Unable to connect to service. Yeah, I'm getting the same If there are no further questions, I will now request the official representatives to vote on resolution number three to adopt the FY 2020 NCSS annual report for the year ended 31st March 2021. At this juncture, I would like to request all official representatives to vote on the three resolutions if you have not done so. The voting will close in one minute. Thank you.
We are telling the votes right now. Please continue to vote. You have 30 more seconds to vote. Good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, I understand that we are facing some, we are having some technical difficulties. I know it can be very frustrating for you, all of you to help us in voting, but the team is trying their best uh, to remedy the situation. I do apologize on behalf of the NCSS team. Uh, we're trying to reset the system and in terms of the voting time itself, we were making a further announcement as to when it will end. Again, we do apologize for the technical difficulties that we're having. We're trying our best to remedy it. Thank you. For those of you uh, who are having difficulty posting the questions, I understand that you need to go to the resolution section at the, you scroll down to the, to the end of the three resolutions and then you will see a section for you to post your questions. You have now the last three seconds to cast your vote, please. Thank you, everyone. Again, our apologies. Thank you for the voting. We will now give some time for the results to be tallied. Thank you everyone again.
What's the news? <laughs> okay, zero what the games. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to announce that for resolution number one, we have received 94 votes for and zero votes against. With that, I will now confirm the minutes of the NCSS AGM 2020 are now confirmed. For resolution number two, we have received 84 votes for and zero votes against. With that, the FY 2020 NCSS audited financial statements of accounts for the year ended 31st March 2021 are now received and adopted. For resolution number three, we have received 78, 78 votes for and zero votes against. With that, the FY 2020 NCSS annual report for the year ended 31st March 2021 is now received and adopted. Lastly, I would like to confirm that there were no resolutions or other matters received from members for this AGM. Before I close the AGM, please I extend our apologies again about the technical glitches. We can, and you know that we will try to do better next year. I will now call the AGM to a close and hand over to the MC to continue to, with the dialogue segment. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Latif. We now move on to a dialogue with members. If you have any questions for our panel members, please type it in the questions for dialogue box on your screen. I would now like to hand over the time to Ms. Anita Pham, President of NCSS, to facilitate the dialogue with members. Ms. Pham, please. Thank you, Sheena, for emceeing and Latif for, for really helping us and guiding us through um, the AGM process. Uh, once again, I also extend my personal apologies for the technical glitches that took place. I know some of you had the frustrating experience of trying to log in in the first instance and then with voting. Um, we had to reboot the system partway through. Uh, and uh, I guess this is the challenge of having a virtual AGM it's a learning journey for all of us, and I apologize. Um, I'm going to leave this segment open. I know um, you might have challenges putting in your questions, so I'm going to leave it open for a bit to give you time to uh, navigate through that system again. And I don't know whether it's uh, the feedback I got just now was that you had to really scroll past everything in order to lodge questions, and when you did ask a question, it brought you to a different page. So um, it will be an adventure if you would like to ask us some questions now uh, on this. I thought in the meantime, you know, just to reiterate a little bit of the sharing that I did this morning, and it's first of all to thank all of you for going through such a challenging time last year and this year as well. And I must applaud you for your, your resilience, 
your creativity in all that you have done. I, the wonderful stories and examples that I've seen over the past year have been an absolute inspiration. And I really want to take my hat off to every single one of you for all that you've done. It has given me so much hope for this sector and I just look forward to all that you will be doing for our service users and for the sector going forward. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was, you know, as we shift from that, that idea of being program centric, which is a legacy thing that we've had, to being person centered and system centric, I know for some of us it will really take us out of our comfort zones, but it's really having that openness, that openness to change and to experiment and to see how we can do best by our service users, many of whom are probably facing even exacerbated challenges in, in the situations that they're in. So it's, this is the time to see how we can work with others, to collaborate with others, and others being beyond the universe of our social service agencies and members within NCSS. Others, meaning volunteers, for profits, uh, different ministries, different agencies, social enterprises. It's, we should not be limited by our original sort of definition or understanding of what this sector was, because now it really is an ecosystem. Just leaving it open a little while longer. Thank you, Dinesh, for the words of encouragement that you shared with us. I think it's an exciting journey for all of us going ahead. Ah, what are NCSS plans in using the reserves to benefit the community and support SSAs? You know, there are many things that we're doing. I mean, reserves, as you all know, I mean, even as a general principle, is rainy day fund that we have. And what we're doing is part of the, the um, from this past year, part of it that we're using is actually going to be swept into the Community Capability Trust Fund. Because, and the CCT is an area which is, if you look at it, it for funders and donors, funding capability building is something that we are not so familiar with. We're usually more accustomed to funding programs and services. So this is an area which we think we need a little bit of time to, to, for people to change mindset and to invest in capability building. So that is what we're doing with part of our reserves to put into this fund. So it will benefit all our members going forward and the sector. So that's part of it that we will put in. Yep. I don't know whether Lisan would like to add to that. Thank you, Anita. I'll just add a few points. Uh, so as Anita said, uh, reserves are our rainy day fund, uh, but yet uh, we, we are also planning to you know, put the reserves to good use and to invest it in building capabilities. So I mentioned just now in my sharing that uh, NCSS is also uh, undergoing our own internal transformation, and one of it is about building stronger digital and technical capabilities. Uh, and we do plan to, you know, uh, invest a small part of our uh, reserves in in doing so. Uh, so in investing in some of the um, the digital. Um, uh, sort of priorities and projects uh, that I mentioned earlier, including, for example, the social service navigator, so that we can have an integrated service directory for the public to navigate all the services of SSAs uh, available. Uh, it is our dream eventually to also be able to overlay, you know, demand sort of information on the navigator so that, you know, at one glance we can sort of match demand and supply, but that's a dream. Uh, it is something to work on. In the meantime, there are also internal uh, systems that, that we are working on, uh, including a, a more seamless grants portal so that all of you SSAs, you know, applying for grants, whether it's from NCSS or the TOAD board, um, can have that single portal 
um, uh, with to use to apply for grants and to also report outcomes and so on. So, so that's what we hope to invest uh, part of our reserves in. Th thank you very much for all those of you who have given us the encouragement and, and really appreciate the understanding. Uh, I think like all of you, we are also uh, uh, navigating technology. So apologies for, for the glitches just now and thank you for the understanding. Uh, for, for, to post your questions, please go to the ongoing activities tab and click on join under questions for dialogue section. You may post your questions after clicking on join. I thought in the meantime, I'd just share with you that you know, we're just re restarting the work on the 4ST and we've convened um, a, a, a panel who will be working on this over the next few months. Um, the, it's really building in, um, we're not going to be changing the, the, the vision uh, of the 4ST, but it's really probably you know, creating clearer pathways for all of us going forward. So the work is, is starting on that. We've done a lot of consultation and continuing with the consultation with the sector for the rest of this year. Any other questions? There don't seem to be other questions. So I was going to open it up for another minute or so, just in case you're having technical difficulties getting in to asking those questions. It makes life very exciting doing it this way. <laughs> okay, there are a couple of questions. Uh, what investments did NCSS make <laughs> that gave us such high returns? So, Justine, would you like to share? Was it Kyung Ho who's going to share with us? Yeah, okay. Um, uh yeah, I think oh, just, Anita. Justin, Justin will? Just, yeah. uh, Justin, you can supplement. Uh, I think the, uh, we, we have quite a fair bit of uh, funds that are uh, put with the uh, investment manager. And uh, I think the, uh, this year probably because the market is good. So we, the investment uh, returns has coming um, very much uh, uh, beyond our expectation. So the returns is in a double digit, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Thank you, Kiano. Yeah, um, yeah. So to add on, I think we haven't changed our investment mandate. It has always been a um, quite rather conservative one, but given that we are managing, uh, you know, the, the money that is really from the public as well. So I guess it's really like what Kiano say the, the the market has really turned into our favor, and uh, we, we really uh, generated a, a much uh, you know uh, than expected return this year. But overall, we are. Um, you know, we, we really only uh, invest in bonds, equity, that is really rather the, um, the, the, the kind of um, common instrument in the market itself. Thanks, Justin. One of the questions that uh, we've received from John is, would rating of charities be on the cards in the future? Not at this point in time. We, we don't, there is no conversation on that. We are focusing on building up the capability of all our SSA members. And it's this, at this point in time, it's not something that we have even explored. Yeah, I, I think at this point in time, that sort of competition is not helpful. What we're trying to do is really to, to encourage collaboration and for all of us to work together and not compete with each other. Uh, and so rating of charities at this point in time uh, would not, you know, it's not, not opportune to do so. Um, I know in certain parts of the world they do that in terms of it, uh, it helps donors. But I think our angle is really to help 
our SSAs as well as our donors to articulate what impact is, is to measure the impact and the help that we are really um, extending to our service users. So I think that's probably a more constructive approach at this point in time. Uh, maybe let me just reinforce that. Uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of uh, measuring impact, that is something we will do. The idea is not at all to rate uh, charities, but really to give you a framework uh, so that you can evaluate uh, your own programs, the effectiveness of your own programs. Uh, and, you know, when we went out and, and consulted with SSAs, uh, we were actually very, very encouraged uh, that this was something that SSAs welcome. Um, so maybe at the, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this, since this is the third time I'm saying it, um, but I just sort of describe our evaluation framework uh, very briefly again. Uh, on one, it will be two levels. On one level is at the program level, uh, where we will come up with you know a metrics bank, and the idea is for you to select the metrics uh, that make most sense uh, for your program type and for your the subsector that you are in. So. The emphasis very much is on making this meaningful and relevant for you, uh, which is why you know, we have consulted many SSAs and will continue to do so in the next few weeks and months ahead. Uh, at another level, it's really at the subsector or sector level so that we can aggregate and understand outcomes for users um, using the quality of life uh, metrics and, and, and framework um, as a basis for, for, for that. Um, so the, the evaluation framework, we will be briefing uh, uh, SSAs in the coming weeks. So please look out for it. And, and do reach out to us if you'd like to be part of the conversation. I'm still leaving the dialogue open for other questions to come in. You know, we really appreciate all your feedback. So even after this is over, um, there are always these channels for you to reach uh, any of us. Um, we are always available to, to entertain uh, any of your queries and questions that you have. Um, very, very happy to, to answer any of them anytime. Yeah. I believe I, there aren't any more questions coming in. So uh, I'd like to reiterate that even, you know, we're, we're going to be closing this dialogue very shortly, but the communication ch uh, channels are always open. Um, please feel free to, to email any of us um, should you have any further questions uh, or clarifications that you need to make, yeah? We'll be very happy to entertain them. And once again, you know, my apologies uh, for the technical glitches. It's, uh, I guess that's what happens in, in this virtual age. Uh, there are things that we just cannot anticipate. And I thank you for your patience, uh, for, for being with us. And I, we very much appreciate that you've, you've supported us in this throughout. Thank you. So I'm going to hand this over to Sheena once again. Is she going to, if not? Yeah. Thank you all for participating in the dialogue. With that, we have come to the end of the AGM. Thank you for joining us and we wish you a pleasant evening ahead. Thank you.